Thanks for waking up early. I know we're all night owls. I made a fresh pot of coffee. Help yourself. Um, I'm Laura Nelson from Hackers and Founders, and we are delighted to be here at the Reactor for our big data mini conference. Um, Want to thank the people who have given up their time to share their expertise. And um, also wanted to let you know that we will be having a few more conferences like this. And I'm taking uh, recommendations, suggestions for uh, what to do next. It looks like we'll be having an AI machine learning conference next. And I will send you all a bunch of annoying emails on meetup.com. You may thank me later. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Andrew Mall from Microsoft. He is doing the dirty work for me today. Um, we're a little understaffed because we have another conference going on in Mexico at the same time. And remind me to never do conferences in two countries. That's just crazy nutty. So um, with no further ado, Andrew, thank you for saving me. Anytime, Laura. In two countries? That sounds fun. How come we didn't all fly to Mexico? <laughs> So I'm, I'm Andrew, um, I work at Microsoft, got to be, help uh, Laura put all this together and kind of create this conference here. Um, I'm a technical evangelist at, at Microsoft, so I focus on the big data and ML space, kind of looking at trends and building small demos and kind of helping everyone who's using our platform be able to do the things that they want to do. Uh, part of that is this awesome space. Have you guys been here before? How many? No, everybody's probably wondering what's going on with this space and, and how are we in downtown San Francisco in a nice place having a conference. So this is our reactor space. What we're doing here is we're building community around technical topics. Developers come here, work on what we hope to be the next great ideas and build them here. So that's two, two pieces. Uh, behind curtain number one over here, there's a number of coworkers who are working um, through incubators like YC or uh, Alchemist Accelerator and working on their startups in that side of the space. And then obviously that's not all we do. We have this huge side of the space here where we have a lot of small conferences like this or meetup groups, a number of other events that actually come in here. So if any of you do events or are looking for event space or just have questions in general about Microsoft, feel free to find me uh, throughout this conference. This is actually a free space, so if you have cool ideas, I love to talk about them because um, we, have, we have the space and we're always looking to fill it. But it's not just me. There's a number of us here at Microsoft who actually work out of this space. Um, I think the only one here right now is Annie in the back. She's our community manager who uh, focuses on kind of making sure we're all working on the right things and making sure all the, everything gets tied together and we have great events and we're engaging with the communities. As I said, I dive into most of the big data and ML. We have people who look at VR and AR, gaming, um, Python and open source, and pretty much every technology that, that you might be using now or want to use in the future. So that's a little spiel about us, why we're here. Um, I also have a couple slides on why I think 2016 is going to be a huge year for big data. So I have four points that I'd like to make with that. The first one being that big data is here. How many of you have heard of big data? How many of you have heard of Hadoop? How many of you are running a Hadoop or have kicked the tires with Hadoop? Okay, we're still looking like a lot of people raising their hands. Big data is here. We're doing it now. We're no longer talking about potentially the three, four, seven, ten Vs that we've been talking about a lot and in introducing people to the idea of big data as much as we're actually out doing it now. So now that we're here and we're working on it, I think 2016 is really going to be a big year so that we can start to build things that we've been talking about for these last few years. I've been talking about big data for four years, so personally I'm excited to see how everything is starting to shake out now. Secondly, we have more data. There's cheaper devices, cheaper data producers, and they're everywhere collecting and, and gathering data. For example, think of a car 10 years ago versus a car now. Crazy amounts of data are being captured now that weren't being captured 10 years ago. Not only is that data being collected, but we now have a place to store it. So the cloud has been a huge proponent in why I think that big data is really going to explode uh, again this year. We're going to build a lot on it. 
because if you come to a cloud provider, uh, look at Azure or any of the other cloud providers, you're going to be able to go up to them and say, hey, I have, a I have you know, 10 petabytes of data, and, and we're ready to store that. Um, five years ago when the cloud was first coming out, we might not have been able to do that. But now it's here, we can store that data, and we're not just throwing it in a RAID in the back box and you know, stacking them in, in rows. There's actually ways to process it now. So we're able to have frameworks like Hadoop, like Spark, we're going to learn about some other ones um, today, that are actually able to process this data. So not only do we have the data, we have a way to store it, we have a way to process it. All of those are becoming more and more mature and are going to lead to the ability to actually have good, good insights this year. So third, everyone's doing it now. You guys laughed when I said, who here has heard of big data? Because we've been talking about it, and now people are doing it. Everyone's doing it. This is great because it drives community. We have a lot more community around this now. I think it's easier to get started using big data today than it ever has been before. You can think about it um, if a startup wanted to go and build a big data company. And we're going to hear a little bit more about maybe that startups shouldn't, or you know, why startups would build a big data company. But if they wanted to do that, it's possible now. It's not a huge capital expense to go and buy a bunch of servers. They just spin this up in the cloud. And there's tons of steps and a lot of ways to do that now. The community is huge and it's continuing to grow. So everyone is doing it. Also, I think this is important. The hype has shifted. We've moved the hype from big data and tossed it on machine learning. <laughs> but what they don't know is that you still need big data to do all that machine learning. So it's still important, and I think this is a good thing since that hype has shifted. We can actually focus now on what's important. A lot of the things that were coming in there, a lot of the noise around big data is now moving over to, to AI and machine learning and all these other technologies, and we can focus on actually creating value. I'm sure everybody's seen kind of the hype cycle. Um, I think now we're in that linear path where we're going to start creating more and more value, and it's going to be coming more and more real throughout this year. So those are kind of the four reasons I think this is super important and that 2016 is probably going to be one of the biggest years we've had so far um, because of the fact that big data is here now. We have the infrastructure in place and the processing power in the cloud. Uh, everyone's doing it, so the community is growing. And we have gotten rid of a lot of the noise to allow us to work on the things that actually matter. So um, now I'm going to let the people who are building these solutions and who have been working in big data for um, a long, long time get up here and talk a little bit. So our first speaker is going to be uh, Baji He. So Baji, thanks for your time today. So he has been doing this for quite some time, spent some time at a data engineer at Yahoo and Tapjoy, was a, a part of a founding team for Deep Forest Media, which is a marketing firm that had a lot of AI implementations within it. And now he's the director of engineering at Rakuten Marketing. So, Baji? Um, hi, uh, my name is Bai Jihi. Um, right now I work for Rakuten Marketing, and I will talk about what is Rakuten and does anybody know about Rakuten? OK, um, about half of the audience. And so um, today, um, thanks for um, hackers and founders for inviting me to um, give this introduction into big data. And I will talk about um, our experience of uh, building a big data company um, from the scratch. And so right now I am the director of uh, Rakuten Marketing, focusing on data engineering and uh, data science. And a little bit more about my background. Um, so three years ago, we founded a company called Deep Forest Media. So the name is like a combination of uh, deep learning, uh, random forest, or, and then media. Media is for marketing. So uh, we knew we are going to be a big data company uh, using machine learning from the startup. And uh, so what we do is uh, mobile advertising. So does anybody know about advertising? Yeah. So that's basically how um, Google and Facebook and Yahoo make money. And, and the, when we started in 2013, the trend was uh, shifting from desktop to mobile. And, um, and there's a huge gap there because uh, nobody 
knows, I mean, yeah, there's no good solution of uh, figure out how to check users between uh, desktop and mobile. And we, our founding team had a background of doing advertising and also uh, mobile games. And we think we might, we might have a shot um, to um, improve this um, and to develop some technology that can help um, other companies to do better marketing. So, and so somebody may not like advertising because we are just showing ads on your phone or your desktop. Um, but for um, companies who wants to grow their business, uh, marketing is very powerful too. And so we are trying to help those companies. And before that, um, I have a big data background. I build a data infrastructure in Tapjoy, uh, which is a uh, um, mobile ad network platform um, right here in downtown San Francisco. Uh, and then before that, I worked for Yahoo. I worked in the strategic data solution team, um, working on BI, data warehousing, uh, behavioral targeting, user profiles. And uh, since in early uh, 2006 and 2007, um, Yahoo has been uh, um, creating, I mean, building Hadoop in their in-house. So I was the early adopter of Hadoop. And yeah, and then, OK. Um, so for people who's not sure about, um, haven't heard of Rakuten. Rakuten is a Japan company um, whose revenue is about at 11 place uh, in 2015. And they do e-commerce like Amazon. They also do other business like uh, banking, insurance, travel agents. So they are basically a, a go-to site or go-to company for uh, Japanese. And now they are expanding their um, right, presence in, in the world wide. And so that's why um, there's a Rakuten marketing company and they acquire us. Okay. And so um, uh, let me talk briefly about what we are doing in Deep Forest Media, because that uh, will help you to understand why we need big data. So we are helping uh, advertisers who has a product and want to reach out to more users. We help them to engage consumers. And we want to drive revenues so that um, more people will uh, buy their product or uh, engage with their product. And, uh, and how we do it is through, uh, we're not only using mobile channel, but we are doing it cross channel uh, across um, desktop, mobile, uh, social media. Um, so, and we also uh, develop an in-house uh, technology to um, track the user across device uh, in a probabilistic way. And that's help, helping the issues where um, in the industry it's very difficult to tie um, action or tie purchases back to the original uh, impression or clicks. So uh, with this cross-device technology, we were able to uh, hugely improve that. And also, uh, we are doing real-time programmatic uh, bidding. So that means um, every second in the world, uh, I, in the US, there are maybe uh, 300 million users, mobile users, and they are browsing their uh, different apps and different websites. And whenever um, those we call publisher, they want to um, sell their space to uh, provide the ad to the user. 
and that uh, that bit request is transferred to us in real time, and we have to make a decision uh, based on what we know about the user, what we know about the context, uh, to decide on what ads we can serve and what price we can offer. And there's a whole exchange like the uh, uh, eBay auction uh, in behind. So uh, this is a uh, very huge volume, uh, like more than uh, 100,000 QPS. And we have to make decisions uh, within tens of milliseconds. Um, because of this, um, we are receiving a lot of data, and we have to make decisions based on data very fast. And so even when we are doing a startup, when we are building the MVP, uh, uh, minimal viable product, we know we are dealing with big data. So at the beginning, we choose to um, leverage our background to use some big data technology. And so, so before I, before I uh, went to this talk, I did a search online and uh, wanted to see what people are talking about big data technology for small startups. Uh, I, I found a slide called uh, why and when not to use big data. <laughs> and it's basically saying it, um, it's too expensive to use big data technology because either the technology is too complex uh, or the cost of uh, having a huge farm or machine is too high. And um, I kind of agree with that, but uh, that situation is improving, especially uh, in the recent years uh, because of cloud, like Andrew mentioned. Um, so the cost of having a Hadoop cluster, for example, is much lower than when we, uh, what we are doing in Yahoo before. And uh, also, because they, big data technology is so um, popular now, I think most of the people, most of the engineers know about big data. And so the cost of having your team to um, have a big data technology is much lower now. Um, OK, so um, I. So this is what we are building uh, in Deep Forest Media right before we were acquired by Rockerton. And we built this uh, with uh, basically five engineers. And uh, a lot of the components uh, involve big data. You, you can see that Hadoop, uh, Flume, Kafka, and uh, some data pipelines, some uh, optimization, machine learnings, and a bunch of um, servers. Um, so I will talk about the technologies we use here. And um, so, Everybody, uh, when, when people talk about big data, they talk about uh, four Vs, uh, five Vs. So I'm also going to talk about that. Uh, in the, before we were acquired by Rockerton, we were already like, receiving 10 terabytes per day. And we are uh, saving uh, uh, 10 petabytes, tens of petabytes, uh, some of them in our Hadoop cluster, some of them in S3. Um, but the data volume is huge. And uh, the velocity is also um, like very <laughs> um, big. So we have to, because we have to make decisions uh, for every big request within 10 milliseconds, and there's a lot of it, uh, so we have to make sure the latency of the whole system is very low. Um, and we do uh, retargeting, which is uh, like, for example, if we want to uh, show ads to user who just um, adds something to their shopping cart, and we can do that. We can just serve ads 
choose to create a user segment and just show the ads to those users. And all these are happening uh, in a real-time fashion, and uh, as well as frequency cap, which is uh, similar related, uh, because we, want, we don't want to show too many ads, same ads to the same user. So, and all these are done in our real-time pipeline and has the latency of uh, hundreds of milliseconds. Um, and uh, variety means uh, we have a lot of different types of data. We have, uh, so RTB is real-time bidding. Uh, there are actually um, ad exchanges who are collecting data from all the publishers in the world and sending to us. And uh, they have different format. Um, although there's a common proto protocol um, or called the uh, open RTB, but not every one of them is uh, like using that protocol. And uh, even that protocol is pretty loose, and uh, so the data varies a lot. Some, for some publishers, they may have geo data. For some publishers, they don't. They, they may provide some user information, uh, demographic information, stuff like that. And then after we do the bidding, we have to um, serve as, we have we build our own ad server and checking server. Uh, so data comes in in different format. We have to link the, the bidding to um, impression, to click, to uh, the all the actions, purchases. And also we, uh, we are getting third party data from uh, data pro other data providers, for example, data about user, data about uh, just uh, shopping categories, uh, things like that. So we have to be uh, very flexible with, um, with how we can uh, 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 ingest and use this data and to help the business. And we ho only have a, engine, um, a team of five people. Uh, so uh, some of the technologies here I will talk about is going to help us to uh, make this happen. Okay. And so um, as I said, our company was a big data uh, startup. Uh, big data is helping enormously uh, helping our company to build our product. And so it's a circle here. Um, it's a feedback loop. So we build some edge server. Edge server means uh, just external servers, external servers, uh, which collects all kinds of information. And they, they generate a huge amount of uh, data in different format go through different uh, data databases or data store. Uh, that was our da big data infrastructure. And then when we are able to use the data, we can build data products uh, like this retargeting cross device. And um, some of them are internal, some of them are external. And uh, some of them are like, uh, batch, and some of them are real-time. And so, uh, for example, reporting and analytics goes, uh, goes to users, but some of the um, data products like retargeting, budgeting, pacing, optimization will directly control the edge servers and control how they behave. And so, this is the feedback loop we are going to build. Uh, we built, and so I'm going to dive into uh, some technologies, uh, big data technologies uh, that's used in our company. So for data collection, um, Flume. Uh, has anyone heard of Flume? <laughs> okay, engineers, yeah. <laughs> um, so we use Flume a lot. Uh, even 
three, four years ago, uh, because it's very, um, you, it's distributed, it's reliable, and uh, it's easy to config, meaning it's, it's very flexible. If you want to have a new types of data, uh, the input data, you can quickly change some config, and um, it can do the work. And it works well with uh, all the other big data technologies, like uh, Hadoop file system, Kafka, XSpace, uh, Spark, um, and uh, so the basic architecture is like uh, we use source to um, listening to uh, the data generated either by external party or generated generated by our edge servers, and um, and it it can be uh, structured data or can be unstructured data, and so. All the sources go to channels. Channels is uh, the place where you can uh, relay the data to sync. And the channel can be reliable, or uh, if the throughput is too high and you don't have to store all the data, it can be uh, in unreliable uh, memory, but it has higher throughput. Um, OK, and the sync, um, you, well, we can. Um, Mostly, we are saving the data uh, from Flume to Hadoop file system. And uh, some of them, we are also creating a thing so that it can send the HTTP request out to uh, other servers. And so it's, it's very uh, flexible. And in between, there are some uh, interceptor which uh, allows us to do uh, minimum stream processing with very low latency, yeah, even lower than what Spark streaming can do. Um, and uh, the channel selector allows us to, uh, to either replicate the data or do round robin uh, or split the data based on some uh, tag. Um, and So Flume was um, basically uh, our main uh, data injection tool, which saved data to Hadoop file system for batch processing. And uh, Kafka is another uh, um, distributed message queue that we use to uh, power the real-time data. And right now, all the um, servers uh, basically, we use Kafka for, we write everything into Kafka. And some of the data can go to Flume and then save to Hadoop. And uh, Kafka can also have multiple consumers reading the data directly and uh, independently. So we, we were able to build a lot of um, data products directly consuming data from Kafka. For example, uh, the we can do some deduping. Um, we can just write, uh, um, for example, impression data into Kafka, and then have a consumer to read it and uh, do deduping. Uh, and also, uh, frequency cap is also built in a similar fashion. Um, and uh, so one good thing about Kafka is uh, it's available in many language, programming languages. Uh, so we, well, in our company, although we have a small engineering team, but we, our philosophy is to choose whatever uh, uh, suitable for the job. Um, so it, in terms of programming language, we have a lot of variety. We have, uh, like for example, uh, the real-time builder is built in C and C++ for uh, performance consideration. And a lot of the external web services are built in uh, Java. Now we migrated to Go. Um, and also we have, we have also in the data engineering team and data science team, we use uh, Python and Scala a lot. And so 
they all work really well with Kafka. And that's really the good thing we like about Kafka. Uh, so I'm going to dive deeper into data format. Um, I think that's really important, and it's, it was an important decision we, we made um, early on, because um, well, our data is in uh, very many different formats, and in order to uh, get some like, intelligence out of the data, we have to have a structure so we choose to use Avro as our um, data serialization format, which brings schemas and clinics, cleanliness to the data. And it can deal with uh, schema evolution. That means every time you uh, add a column or change a column or drop a column, change the ordering of the column, it's also it's all of them are handled by the Afro schema evolution. So we don't need to worry about the data uh, backward compatibility. And it works really well with Hadoop and uh, Impala, Spark. So yeah, I, I remember back in uh, TabJoy, we use uh, JSON a lot. And uh, it is kind of a pain because uh, it's not that uh, efficient. And we, every time we have to parse JSON, um, although it's flexible, but the parsing is taking too much time. It's not compact enough. But um, in comparison, Avro is much more compact. And uh, also JSON doesn't deal with the schema change that well. Meaning you can change the schema because it's schema list, but when you want to have some schema on your data, you have to do that manually to make sure um, it doesn't break. So all the data we collected, we save in Afro format. And for uh, analytic, we use a different format called Parquet. It's uh, just a columnar storage format. Uh, Meaning, for example, there's a table with um, like 100 fields, and it's storing the fields, uh, the values for a field together. So there can be compressions. Say if a field has uh, very few distinct values, it's saving very little data. So, and, and so it's highly efficient for analytic queries. Um, there's an, another database, Vertica, or Redshift, which I will talk about. It's also using this columnar storage format. Um, and, but what we are doing is in Hadoop, we are, for all the derived data, we are storing them in columnar format. So they work well with um, not only um, well, columnar database, but they work well with uh, Hive, Impala, Spark and really improve because of the format itself. Um, the format alone will improve the analytic queries uh, in a factor of 10 or even more. Okay, um, so we are doing a lot of batch processing uh, in our um, system. Because I'm from the uh, um, BI or data warehouse background, so uh, I was doing ETL, uh, extract, transform, load uh, for many years. So I'm very familiar with uh, batch processing. And uh, because of how we collect and store the data, uh, we were able to um, use a lot of the batch processing tools uh, in, in our system. Uh, I include Hive, uh, which can work on, work with different execution engine now. It used to be MapReduce, but now uh, there's a huge improvement of uh, using Spark, or even Tets. I think Tets is the, the best execution engine for Hive right now. Um, and we also use Spark for, um, not for analytic, uh, but for machine learning. 
and it's, uh, if we want, it's, the code is relatively easy to write and Java MapReduce. So if we want to do some custom uh, MapReduce, we also write it in Spark. Uh, and for analytic and for ETL, we actually use uh, Impala. It's a uh, um, massive parallel uh, processing system or uh, uh, data SQL engine built by um, Cloudera. And uh, it's not written in uh, any JVM language. It's written in C and C++. Purpose. So it's very fast for data up to a terabyte. Um, and it's constantly beating the performance of uh, Hive on Tets and uh, Spark. And so when we do, uh, for example, hourly or daily uh, data processing, uh, we basically write a lot of SQL to do that. And Impala is really the best tool for um, running those transformation on uh, data up to a terabyte. And Impala combined with Parquet uh, makes the query really fast. Uh, a lot of query returns in second or even sub-second. And uh, in terms of real-time data pipeline or stream processing, uh, we also have a lot of choices. And uh, I think the Hadoop ecosystem is providing a few uh, choices. Uh, uh, Storm, we are not using Storm. Uh, but if we want to do some simple event um, enriching, for example, we add some tag to the data or some simple transformation validation, we can use uh, Flume Interceptor. Actually, not too many people know about that, but um, it's very low latency. And because we have a, a Flume cluster, so it's very obvious for us to just add this to our Flume cluster and be able to uh, do a lot of the stream processing. Um, and they are, the stream processing Flume Interceptor can do is really event-based. Uh, when we want to do micro-batching, uh, for example, we want to aggregate or do some windowing, joining, uh, look up external uh, data stores, we will do it in Spark Streaming. Um, and also, we've, um, when sometimes the latency requirements is uh, too low, and so in the past year, um, it becomes uh, and more and more that we started to use uh, Golang to um, just consume the data from Kafka and then uh, processing in real time. Um, so we also have some uh, custom code to do uh, stream processing. Um, so next go to data serving. Uh, again, the big data um, world is providing a lot of tools and we add in some uh, custom codes ourselves. Um, so for, uh, for serving data or for real time uh, accessing the data, uh, we try different data store. We've tried uh, Redis, uh, which uh, was on single server, but recently they've added the cluster mode, but we haven't tried it. Uh, we've tried the uh, arrow spike, which is uh, not free. Um, but I think they are doing pretty good for uh, read. Uh, we use HBase to uh, serve our user profile. And so it works, I really like it because it's integrated with the Hadoop system. So you can use MapReduce, Hive, or Spark to write data right into HBase. Uh, and then your data is available and you can do some um, also some data processing in XBase, and the data will be available for um, low latency. I mean, the latency usually is a millisecond, 99% uh, of the time, um, and it can be used by other um, servers. 
our services. Um, Cassandra is another one we are trying. Um, is uh, al almost the same as XBase, and and then for um, for well, there are those are real-time data serving, and for um, s serving the data for analytic purpose, we use uh, actually a combination of Impala uh, or Vertica. So Vertica is a columnar-oriented SQL database. And uh, it's used by, uh, I think it's used by TapJoy, used by uh, Singer. And uh, it's, uh, it, it powers our um, user, our web portal. So in our web portal, the users can um, set up campaigns. And in real time, they will see how their um, campaign setup affects their or reach or uh, like potential performance. And all this data comes from Vertica. And also, um, there's a reporting portal, uh, also part of the, the, the main web portal. Uh, and we build our own UI uh, in uh, AngularJS to read the data from Vertica and build some beautiful graph and charts. and all of these are very interactive because of Vertica expecting the interactive queries. And uh, all the queries can return, uh, if we return it right, is all the queries can return in tens of milliseconds. That's awesome. Um, we have some experimentation, experiments with uh, MemSQL, which is um, also compelling, but uh, uh, in, re in reality, it's a kind of um, uh, mix, so uh, it's not a must-have for us. So we didn't choose, it's not, it's low latency, it's uh, MySQL-like, so that means um, it's also distributed, so that is a suitable uh, replacement for MySQL as well as we can run um, queries on top of MemSQL because it's in memory and all the queries is combined to native code. So there's very low latency for um, generate the execution plans. And, and it's quite fast, uh, but not fast enough that um, we want to use it to replace our other technologies. Um, there are places where we want to have even lower latency, uh, which is uh, like hundreds of uh, microseconds uh, in our real-time beta. Uh, in that case, well, usually we will have multiple levels of caching. Um, in, in this case, we choose to use RocksDB. And so RocksDB itself has uh, at least two layers of caching, some of them in memory, some of them in SSD. Uh, and so, and our bitter code, our C++ code can directly uh, read the data from RocksDB. It's an in embedded database. Um, in this case, um, so the latency is usually um, 100 microseconds for um, key value lookups. So I don't think that's something provided by any uh, on the market uh, big data technology, but we, it's something we have to build it in-house. Okay. Um, we have a data science team and data analytic team right now. So we do, we do a lot of uh, analytics. And the tool of choice is uh, Actually, our number one love tool is Impala because it's uh, integrated very well with Hadoop. And as soon as the data arrives from Flume, we can query the data. And as long as you are um, not looking for like, um, tens of terabytes of data, the query usually returns in seconds, even. 
uh, for some of the um, simple, I mean, uh, analytics on the low, uh, smaller data set, it returns in sub-second. Um, and uh, Vertica is uh, similar, but we have to uh, load the data from Hadoop to Vertica. So we only use Vertica for backing the portal. Well, versus for Impala, we can really uh, explore all the data in uh, Hadoop. Uh, Spark uh, is get, gaining a lot of traction, um, and so we are using it mainly for machine learning. And it has an awesome uh, API, similar to what people are doing in Python. Uh, so we like it, and we are hoping to adapt more. Um, okay. So for reporting, uh, like I mentioned before, we use Vertica. Uh, and uh, we also use Tableau. OK. Um, so Tableau can directly read data from Vertica, Impala. And uh, so the analytic team uh, and the media bio custom service team, they all like it. And for monitoring, um, we we used to uh, have carbon whisper graphite, which is pretty standard, and now we are uh, turning into uh, Infus DB plus Grafana. Uh, we like it because the configuration is much simpler, the design is modern, and it's written in Golang. And and then uh, for alerting, we are. Um, we used to have uh, batch jobs to run queries and send alerts. Now we are uh, switching to using Elasticsearch. We are placing the events into Elasticsearch and have an a, a open source project called Elastic Alerts to generate rule-based alerts, uh, which uh, are not only server alerts, but also uh, business alerts. Like, for example, someone set up a campaign and it it didn't have impression for today. It was send alerts, something like that. So it's, uh, the rules are easy to add, and uh, any team can add that, not only engineering team. OK, so this is our team. Uh, we have five data engineering, five en data engineers, and uh, six data scientists. And we have two DevOps people, uh, which are helping us for the data infrastructure uh, administrations part time, and so we're we're hiring. Okay. Good. Does anyone have any questions? Um, if you do, let me know. I need them in the mic for the video. Can I just start with an observation, like? Yeah. I can't get past this. Like, I'm not sure that I would want to use Kafka for anything. Like, it doesn't inspire me knowing. What, maybe somebody was just really depressed, like when they when they wrote it. I don't know. A little scary. Uh, oh, for the love of God, Camus, really? <laughs> I guess we'll hit all the philosophers by the time we're done. Anybody? Good. Then thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for having me. Cool. Thanks again, Baji. So next up, we have Greg Lindell. So Greg has quite a lot of experience in the data realm. I don't really know where to start. Um, maybe we could start with the fact that he's founded a company that did search similar to Google's, called Blecko, and had, that has been sold for a little bit now. Um, and now that he has so much free time, he's decided that he's gonna spend a lot of time at the Internet Archive, where he manages over 25 petabytes of data. Um, and if you ever wanna get a coffee with him, he likes cappuccinos, but he has special requests. So maybe get the recommendation on where to go from Greg. So as he's setting up here, this is Greg, all for you. 
Okay, well, uh, so uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to come speak. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, big data at the, uh, at the Internet Archive. Um, but first, a little bit more. So, uh, so Bleco uh, was a search engine startup, um, like Google, only less successful. And uh, after seven years and eight months, uh, we exited. Uh, we got bought by uh, IBM Watson. And that was uh, 12 months ago on uh, March 28th. Uh, a, a day that's written in stone. Um, selling your uh, startup to uh, IBM can be a great thing. Uh, they wanted to keep all of our technology and all of our people, which is uh, super awesome. But the, the sales process, it takes six months. Um, and it's like taking your head off with a belt sander. Um, so uh, I, I don't recommend that part of the, uh, the process, but, uh, but I, I love the exit. Um, OK, so, uh, so I now work at the Internet Archive. and. Uh, uh, probably a lot of you have, uh, have visited there, although you may not remember it as being the Internet Archive, because we have a lot of different faces we present to the public. Um, but overall, um, our, uh, our uh, goal is uh, universal access to all knowledge, a uh, very modest goal, um, and we're uh, well on our way. So we have a lot of stuff uh, in our collections, right? So we've got uh, uh, software titles, uh, like uh, old uh, video games. Um, we've got uh, moving images, videos. We've got a, a book archive. We actually keep physical uh, copies of books, so we can loan one electronic copy for each physical copy that we own for part of our collection. Um, we have a bunch of uh, audio recordings. And so this, uh, this uh, background is sort of your uh, nice uh, bucolic uh, country scene, uh, because, uh, for example, uh, a lot of uh, folk music uh, collectors have uh, uploaded audio recordings uh, to the Internet Archive. Um, we have a very uh, large amount of television, and uh, especially uh, recently uh, we've been uh, building a, basically an, an archive of uh, political TV ads. Um, so if you see an analysis in the press about XYZ getting free airtime uh, or uh, the relative amount of coverage on news programs or who's spending how much money where, um, almost all that comes from us. Uh, because we have a project going uh, during the primaries, uh, and it's very likely that we'll get money to go on to the general election uh, to do the same thing. So, uh, you know, eventually scholars will be writing uh, papers about the genius of Donald Trump being able to get a lot of, uh, you know, free coverage basically from news programs. When his campaign was young, he ran very few ads and had a ton of media exposure, and that is uh, unprecedented in American political history. Um, and we have the raw data. Uh, that, that you need to write that paper. Um, we have a bunch of uh, e-books that are separate from, you know, things that were actually scanned from uh, physical books. Um, and then, finally, we have 482 billion web page captures in the Wayback Machine. So we have an archive of the web going back to 1996. And if your, your web page was popular enough, uh, you're in our archive. Um, so uh, all that adds up to uh, a lot of bytes. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's just 25 petabytes, right? And you put petabytes up there, and, and it sounds like a nice little you know, term. But when you uh, think about how many actual bytes that is, it really adds up to a lot of stuff. And uh, so this uh, 25 petabytes, um, about uh, one half of it is the uh, Wayback Machine archive, and the rest of it is all the rest. And as you might imagine, we struggle with the size of video, um, but uh, audio recordings are sort of a trivial amount of data, even though there's a lot of great content there. Um, and if you, if you want to think about the velocity of this collection, um, so yeah, we sort of started slow, but uh, we're growing kind of rapidly. And so at this point, we're adding uh, 2 billion. This is just the web captures. And at this point, we're adding 2 billion web page captures per week to our collection of 482 billion, which is already an obsolete number. I, I try to keep it updated on that slide, and I, I can never quite keep up. Um, OK, so, uh, so we have big data um, at the Internet Archive. And, and I've showed you a little bit about the velocity. Um, I'd also like to emphasize the variety of the collection. Um, so that what you do with, uh, with uh, audio tracks is pretty wildly different from what you do with a book is pretty wildly different from what you do with uh, the, uh, the web uh, collection. And uh, that causes us a, a lot of trouble when it comes to giving people access uh, to our collections. And so in a lot of ways, it's very challenging to find stuff that we have in our collections. And that's mainly uh, revolves around the variety of our data, that we've got search interfaces and discovery interfaces that are not the best for any of our different collection types, because we have one system that does all that. And it's a big challenge for uh, our users. 
this is a look at the, at the, the front page of the, the Wayback Machine. Um, so the, the Wayback Machine uh, is, is used by a lot of people who don't even realize it. Uh, you can even, uh, you, you find links on websites where somebody had a link to something and then eventually it disappeared and so they've linked to it in the Wayback Machine. People tweet out uh, links to the Wayback Machine uh, constantly because, for example, some company changed their terms of service or they changed a web page uh, that, uh, and when there's a controversy involved and a silent change is made, frequently we're the evidence source that people point at. Another thing that's very popular with the legal profession um, is uh, uh, finding prior art for patents. Um, so it's very common uh, that uh, we, uh, the Wayback Machine features in, uh, in uh, these lawsuits. And the neat thing about it is, is so we have an, an affidavit system where we'll go and sort of double check and we'll, we'll say, yes, you know, this capture of this web page was actually made on this date and we stand behind it. We, people, you know, write for that kind of thing all the time. And uh, recently, a, a, uh, the, uh, one of the people, you know, the, the defendant uh, who wanted to get rid of this prior art problem uh, attempted to depose us and they were slapped down by the judge uh, who basically said, uh, it's not the Internet Archive's fault if plaintiff fails to understand how the Wayback Machine works because it is a completely normal part of litigation in the patent field. Uh, and we're happy to support uh, that sort of thing um, at the archive. So there's a huge variety of different things you can do. And today, if you, uh, as you can see, uh, it, it's prompting you to type in an URL into that box that looks like a search box, but it's not a search box. You have to enter the exact URL. And that's one of the challenges for using the Wayback Machine. We have a ton of content in there that if you don't know exactly where it used to be, then you won't be able to easily find it in the Wayback Machine. And this is especially true for websites that disappeared a long time ago. So you could have some website that was the top 10 website in 1998, and people will have a hard time discovering that content in the Wayback Machine, and that makes me sad, and I have some slides about that later. So the current Wayback Machine, when you want to go look at the information for a particular page, it kind of looks like this. It's got this, uh, this lovely uh, spark line uh, that shows you when all the different captures are. Uh, this is Linux.com. Uh, so Linux.com, when it was in, in 1999, it was actually owned by Linux International before it passed on to the Linux Foundation, and it's changed in many ways over the years. Um, but this isn't that useful, right, because it's not really indicating where the page changed. And then this calendar down here is like the worst possible view. So this, uh, this, the size of the circle is how many captures we did on a given day, and really nobody gives a shit how many captures we made on a given day. Um, but, uh, but that's what we have. So, so one of the, the, the fun things I did with our data was attempt to unlock it. And so this is the same website in a different uh, uh, format. And so uh, recently we've started making uh, screenshots of websites. So you see that here on this top row. Um, and then I've divided up the changes to the website into sort of major changes and minor changes. That's based on the changing length of the, of the page, which is information that I had easily available to me. Um, and then frequently the page was either unchanged, and I've, I've uh, combined these two because revi revisit record means that basically it was unchanged and we did not store duplicate data for it, which is something we only started doing in, in 2010 or so. Um, this uh, hover thing uh, uh, shows you the, the, the variety of why we collected something. Uh, people, uh, in, in their, they have this mental model of the Wayback Machine that somehow we have this crawler that magically figures out exactly what to do. But the reality is, is the Wayback Machine is actually the sum of a very large number of data sets done by various people. Um, so the, uh, the archive team is the fourth thing there with 233 captures. Archive team is a bunch of volunteers who go off and, for example, oh my god, GeoCities is about to close. Let's go crawl as many GeoCities pages as we can and upload them to the Internet Archive. So that's a volunteer uh, organization. Um, Alexa Internet uh, has this relationship with us that they crawl the web already and they give us uh, all their data. So up until 2010, they were the overwhelming majority of pages saved in, to the Internet Archive. After 2010, we started crawling for ourselves, and that is based to a certain extent on Alexa popularity data, but also some other stuff. And uh, that's what a, the example of uh, the uh, uh, wide crawls and, and uh, narrow crawls um, so anyway, so, so what does the Internet Archive do well? So you have to keep in mind that we are a 20-year-old organization. We kind of function like a startup, but, but we have systems that, that are very much homegrown. 
Um, and uh, we have a big challenge when it comes uh, to trying to uh, figure out, you know, should we throw out the old system and replace it with something new? So here's what we do well, right? So we've got this, uh, whenever you have data in the archive, it, there's uh, two somewhat geographically separated uh, copies, and, and each one of them is a, is a RAID 1 pair of disks. Um, so we've got basically four copies of your data. Um, we're, we're really good with metadata, and one of the most important pieces of metadata is the, uh, the hash of the content, so we can be confident that the content that we read off the disk is the actual content that we wrote to the disk a long time ago. Um, and we use a strategy for that uh, I call metadata everywhere, where basically we have a zillion copies of our metadata, and there's no centralized metadata database that could explode and cause us problems. Instead, when a node comes up, it looks at all the information on its disks and the metadata they're in, and it goes off and basically reports in to a centralized daemon, oh, by the way, here's some items that I have, and here's the metadata associated with them. And so that's basically the basis. It's discovery of what is on the disks that are plugged into that machine. So we're very good at not losing data, um, but this uh, leads us to uh, challenges, because you think of a lot of data stores, uh, they, they do not have this metadata everywhere property, and we'd like to keep that. So that's one of our challenges in trying to move forward to new software. Um, another thing we're really good at is, uh, is uh, making derived files. So whenever you, uh, somebody uploads a video, in, in Lord knows what kind of format. Um, we have particular formats that we prefer to uh, save things in, so we have an our favorite archival format, and then we have the, the uh, flavor of the week, which is basically the thing that plays on, on browsers, and that changes uh, every three or four years um, as new uh, codecs get pushed down into hardware, and then all the browsers prefer that. And our users would prefer that they could uh, you know, watch a video on their iPad without completely draining the battery. Um, so you have to use the hardware codecs that are available. And we're pretty good at, at doing this. We actually uh, humorously, uh, you know, Wikipedia, uh, and Wikimedia has a whole lot of, of video on their website. And it turns out that we actually do uh, transcoding for them. And that was sort of arranged at the worker bee level, uh, which is kind of fun when you see those sorts of projects uh, going on um, that, that, you know, the, the, the managers at, at uh, Wikimedia and the managers at the Internet Archive actually didn't, didn't even know um, that this uh, collaboration was taking place. And, uh, and that's really fun when that kind of thing happens. Um, what do we do that, that's not so good? So, so um, okay, so we, uh, we're extremely careful with data, right? But, uh, and we own our own uh, servers, uh, which is uh, unusual this, uh, these days. Um, but if you go look at the cost-benefit analysis uh, for us, it is much cheaper for us to own our own uh, servers because we have a very large amount of data and we do want to sort of, uh, you know, use it but in a particular way. And so if you look at the, uh, you know, what Amazon would charge us, to store all this data and make it available, it would be um, a ridiculously large amount of money compared to what we uh, actually pay. And so uh, in our overall budget, uh, the uh, hardware and, and whatnot needed to uh, store that 25 petabytes of data, which is you know, times four, right? So it's really 100 petabytes of data, um, is not a large part of our overall expenses, but it would be if we were on Amazon, just our particular thing with uh, what we uh, do. So we have a standard building block that we use for servers, and it has you know, two sockets that take CPUs per 36 disk slots. Um, so we're not quite as dense as, for example, Backblaze's um, servers. Um, but uh, but uh, as a result of this ratio, right, we've, we've chosen how much compute we have per disk. Um, and almost all that compute uh, is actually used up by the transcoding and OCRA and, and other things that I mentioned, the, the derived pipeline. Um, and so that gives us a very, a very limited ability um, to uh, do additional interesting things on, on top of our data. Um, the drive system doesn't have direct access to the storage, and that's because we're extremely careful with the data. Um, so, if, uh, so, so if you have a, a derived job you know, that's supposed to be, for example, running you know, OCR on this pile of images and spitting out text, um, and it deleted some of the images, it's working on a copy. Um, so that's good for data integrity, um, but unfortunately, you know, the, the trend ever since uh, Hadoop came out, and actually since that initial you know, Google Big Table paper, um, was the sort of seminal feature of Bigtable, in my mind, was that it moved the data to, uh, it moved the compute to where the data is instead of the reverse, right? So Map, MapReduce uh, actually is what I wanted to refer to, not Google Bigtable. Um, the Map, MapReduce paradigm, uh, uh, you know, really works best when you're, when you're not moving all of your data. 
And uh, so unfortunately, the derived system for that safety reason moves the data to where the compute is, and it's one of our challenges. So let's talk about some easy things which are made hard in our system. So we actually literally got this question, right? How much Lux Luxembourgish text is on the web? And I'm like, what the hell is Luxembourg? I mean, I know what Luxembourg is, right? So I went and I looked, and well, it's actually not that challenging, right? So it's a, it's a dialect of, well, you might consider a dialect of German, but of course, they consider it to be a language, so it's a language. Um, and, uh, and there's this lovely library uh, that Google uh, made and open source. It's called CLD2, uh, the Chrome Language Detection Library. Um, it was uh, done by uh, Dick Seitz, for those of you who are historians of, uh, of uh, microprocessor architects. He was the guy who did uh, uh, Deck Alpha, Strong Arm, um, and the uh, um, Broadcom Cybite chip. Um, and he's off doing uh, textual stuff with Google. Um, and so there's this lovely library, CLD2, and, and in one of the versions it has uh, every country language and every regional language, so it recognizes Manx and Galician and uh, C C Catalan and uh, all these other languages um, that are regional ones within um, Europe. Um, so that's super neat, right? And so, oh, I'll, I'll just run a MapReduce job over uh, all the pages in the Wayback Machine, and I'll pull out all the ones that have Luxembourgish on them, and this will make the National Library of Luxembourg uh, very happy with us. Um, so, yeah. So, so, okay, so first we have to run this library over the 12 petabytes of text in the Wayback Machine, and then we have to store the results somewhere. So you notice I haven't mentioned a, a generic data store, right? And a, and a table with 482 billion rows in it is, uh, well, that's uh, challenging, uh, even if you do have a good distributed database. And uh, so, yeah, so, so that's an easy thing that's made hard. And some days, you know, <laughs> I'm not exactly loving uh, uh, big data. Um, so sort of your, your takeaway as a, as a startup, right? You, so you get a chance to pick your tech stack on, on day one. And, and uh, so you sort of have an idea of, you know, look, if we're going to be successful in a couple years, this is what our data size is. So I'll try to pick something that will be useful to me. Uh, at that point, and you, you kind of get to change your mind. If your data's not too big yet, um, you can change your mind. Um, but uh, as an older organization, you don't have that luxury. And uh, the way startups are going these days, uh, a, a mature startup that either IPOs, uh, especially anybody who ends up IPOing, it takes a long fucking time these days. And uh, uh, you, you may well end up stuck in the same trap that we're in, that we're a 20-year-old organization. We have all these particular technologies baked in, and it's very difficult to change, and, and you may discover that you want to do a lot of something that's really hard in your infrastructure. So you'll be, you be sad. Okay, so the Wayback Machine, so we have a crawler that crawls the web, and then you come and you, uh, you paste an URL into the Wayback page, and we want to show you something. So the basic index of it is literally a text file that has 482 billion lines that says, hey, this URL, I, I accessed it, uh, I have a ca capture on this date, and it has you know, this MIME type, and I got this return code, which is usually a 200 for success. Um, and it has this size, and it's, in, it's, it's squirreled away in this file. We have a, a standard called WARC that we use to combine together a bunch of web captures together into a single file for convenience. Um, and so here's the, the offset into that file. Here's the length of it. Um, and here's the, the voila, here's the, the SHA-1 uh, hash of the content. Um, so that, that, that's part of our metadata everywhere. So this file has all that met metadata so you can confirm after you've read the alleged content out of the work that it is the content that it was um, originally and that, that corresponds to the crawlers, logs, you know, hash, blah, blah, blah. So this is a 36 terabyte um, table. Um, and uh, uh, we have an, uh, an open source version of this software that's used by uh, national libraries and it's a single level index because they only have a few million captures, but we have 482 billion captures. Um, so, so not only do we have this you know, table, right? So it, it has an index of the table, right? Which is much smaller than the table to speed lookups, right? Because you can imagine, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna it's a, this table's sorted by URL order. So we, we transform the URL so that it, it sorts with you know, a, a standard ASCII sort. So that's called the cert form of the URL. Um, and, it's, and so we have a, a, instead of doing a binary search through the file, we basically built a B tree 
uh, that points at all the stuff. But, but well, of course, in order for it to have scaled you know, from small 20 years ago to large now, we actually have four indices instead of just one. So we have the all index, which is all the older data. And then when, it, when new data comes in, uh, either the crawler uh, accesses it or a person hits save page now in the Wayback Machine, which is super popular with journalists and anybody who sees something that looks kind of funny, uh, save page now is a pretty good idea uh, to, in order to, to, to um, save it for posterity. Um, so uh, when you hit save page now, you can immediately play that back, and that's because we stuck uh, a record into a, a Redis database, and then over time, as, as, as the work file eventually migrates into the Wayback Machine, uh, gets added to an index called Delta Delta, and then Delta Full, and then all uh, over time. Uh, so for those of you who are uh, long-term Unix heads, that's the way you know, Unix backup, the dump program, always was. It had nine levels uh, for that. So we've got uh, four levels to this. But wait, there's more. Uh, so, okay, so, so, it, it, so the Wayback playback is pretty fast, but I have a, a little footnote. Um, it can immediately play back um, something. So you can save a page and, and you can tweet it out um, to all of your friends, um, and eventually it gets into the main index. Um, uh, but I said it was more complicated. So actually, of course, this table is sharded 300 ways. And this is one of the most unfortunate parts of our infrastructure, and, I'll, and you'll see why on the next slide. Um, so these shards actually live on spinning rust in our infrastructure. And, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, wait a minute, that was only 36 terabytes, and it, it prevents, it, it, it's the thing that the way back, you know, revolves around. Why don't you put that on Flash? And uh, oh, so sad, Flash is hard. Um, and another bad part of this um, is that to have a, uh, if you want to play back a single page, uh, most pages have a lot of embeds. They have images, they have JavaScript, they have CSS, and each one of those is also a lookup. Um, so typically, when you play back a page, it's got you know, 10 additional lookups that it has to do. So there's a lot of lookups into this table going on. Um, so we have a certain level of traffic today, right? So imagine I do something dumb, like I add an effective search engine to the Wayback Machine. What happens? More people use it, and this system will be stressed, because it's sort of already running on the edge. But, but so where are we actually headed? So even worse than adding a search engine, we're trying to get wired into all the web browsers. So if you look in the Chrome extension store, the Firefox extension store, the Microsoft equivalent, um, uh, all of these have multiple extensions that allow you to, to go look in the Wayback Machine for a particular page. So uh, typically it's, it's hooked into the right click menu. So you go to a page, you get a 404, you're like, damn it, I wonder if this is, is in the Internet Archive. Instead of cutting and pasting it, you just right click and you hit, you know, resurrect this page or whatever the thing is called, and it goes and looks it up in the Wayback Machine. So what we're trying to do is, uh, instead of having people download this, which means that only, you know, 0.001% of the people who could benefit actually benefit, uh, we're trying to get it built into all the browsers. Um, so Microsoft had a, a, a Microsoft Edge event uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I met all the right people from Microsoft. That was very exciting. Um, I already know the, the, uh, people with, uh, the best people with uh, Firefox, and so Firefox has a new test pilot program, and we're going to be the first external organization to become a test pilot um, user. So we're going to build, be built into the browser, right? And, um, and so whenever anybody gets a 404, which is a page not found on the web, um, the, the browser is going to come check with us, and if we actually think we have a good capture of the page, it'll have a slide down thing that says, oh, by the way, this page is available in the Internet Archive. Would you like to go look at it? Oh, my God, what's that going to do to our lookup rate? Well, we're not actually sure how many 404s there are in the web, and, and we have a lot of robots uh, currently looking shit up in the uh, Wayback Machine. As you might imagine, if you're a search engine optimization person and you have the opportunity to buy a domain, you might want to find out what the content on that domain used to look like, and uh, people do that all the time in the Wayback Machine. Not exactly what we expected people to use it for, but uh, so maybe 50 to 100 times the uh, lookup rate, right? And I, I described, you know, oh my God, we've got four indices sharded 300 ways stored on spinning rust, and how do you speed that up? Uh, you uh, re-architect it. So, so holy crap, right? So, so that 100x, you know, increase, right, would not be too bad for a greenfield imp implementation of this, right? I would go out and I would buy uh, a, uh, you know, if I'm going to uh, have my own infrastructure, um, I would go out and I'd buy a uh, stack of pizza boxes, I'd stick, you know, like uh, five uh, two terabyte flash drives into each one, and I'd just go to town. Um, and uh, it could be that, you know, clustered Redis would, would do the job and, and my life would be easy. Uh, they, they tell me that there is already somebody who has an index, uh, uh, or rather a, ta a single table um, of the same size who's successfully using clustered Redis for it. Yay, I'm not the first person. 
Um, but this is super awful for us to make that kind of decision within our infrastructure. Um, I mentioned that there was a footnote, right? So the footnote is that, uh, so I, I said it was fast. So it is fast most of the time, but if there's any uh, hiccup in our infrastructure, playback, even that simple lookup of where the hell is that data in our infrastructure, that lookup can involve hundreds of servers. So if we're having any kind of a problem, then it shows up in playback. And when I play back a page, I have to do 10 of these lookups that involve hundreds of servers apiece. It uses all the servers in our infrastructure, and it is super sensitive to a hiccup. So if somebody wants to go read a book, then there's one lookup when they start reading the book, sort of in our infrastructure, and from there on, it's smooth sailing. You're only talking to, to one of two servers by that point. And so book, reading an entire book is not that sensitive to problems in our infrastructure, but Wayback Playback is super sensitive to it. So, so uh, there's two takeaways from this. First, no plan survives contact with reality. So this system looked like a brilliant idea 15 years ago, and oh my god, over 15 years, it's become a mess. And then the second takeaway is, it's never good to be the only person complaining that the infrastructure isn't good enough. Because your coworkers will look, like, look at you like you've got an extra arm growing out of your head. And, and you know, relatively speaking, uh, I do have an extra arm growing out of my head because I have these ridiculous demands that I would like the way back, playback to actually work. <laughs> so the proposed solution um, uh, is that, you know, hey, this is not a particularly expensive uh, thing, um, and there's probably standard software, and so this, thank God, will be my first Greenfield deploy um, of uh, using standard software to uh, be able to solve this particular lookup problem uh, at a very high rate uh, with completely normal software, and there's a bunch of other people who are already using it at that same scale. And that's a, a lovely um, luxury for me, and I'm really looking, enjoying to that, uh, looking uh, at that with enjoyment. Um, as, a, as a startup, uh, you can see what happens in a 20-year-old organization that we went for 15 years. So uh, we should have thrown in the towel on this uh, system a long time ago. And as a startup, you, you, should, you should throw in the towel earlier, much earlier <laughs> than we did um, because it's, it's just necessary to do it. So in hindsight, right, you don't want to be, you know, don't be like us um, and uh, throw in the towel uh, early. So I said I was going to tell you about building a, a search engine for the Wayback Machine. So let's, uh, let, let's do that. Um, so uh, building a search engine at, at the web scale is easier than ever before. I'd say sort of the difficulty peaked in 2009 and it's been getting easier uh, since, right? And why is that? Well, so, uh, uh, you know, Flash came along and, and actually Bleco uh, used Flash um, from day one uh, for everything. But the, the software is becoming a lot easier. Bleco wrote its own NoSQL database uh, because we have this hard problem where we need to invert the outgoing links from a web page, which is what you see when you crawl a web page into incoming links to a web page, which is what you need when you index it. That's a very hard problem, but there are more standard solutions. Um, okay, so let's build a, a, a search engine. Um, and I've, I've, search is uh, struck through for a reason. I'll tell you in a minute. Um, so we're going to iterate over all the HTML files in the Wayback Machine. Um, and we're going to invert the outgoing links into incoming links, and we're going to generate documents. Right, so the, the most important words that describe a web page are actually the incoming anchor text, and the words on the page are really very, very rarely the thing that you know, causes the page to appear at the top of, of anybody's web scale search results. So this is true for Google. This is why uh, you run into situations where I typed in these words, but those words don't appear on the page. Well, that's because those words appear in the incoming anchor text. The anchor text is the underlying, underlined thing on the link that you click on, right, the text. Um, in the link that you clicked on to get to that page. So we're going to invert these links. We're going to toss it. We're going to generate documents. We're going to type in, uh, toss them into Elasticsearch, which you know has a nice clustered uh, thing. And I don't know what's going to happen next. And eventually, it'll just work, right? So, ooh, this is a little more difficult than I thought it was going to be. So first, we have to iterate over all the HTML files and invert them. And that, oh wait, that takes a hundred days because uh, the uh, the aforesaid uh, thing where you know normally in our infrastructure. Uh, you have to copy all that data, so we, we dodged that. We were unsafe. But even the inversion is uh, super expensive, right? We have a Hadoop cluster in-house, uh, but it's only a couple racks of systems, right? So it runs on a tiny fraction of our infrastructure because almost all of our infrastructure is devoted, dedicated to data storage and also uh, the derived system. Uh, okay, so try number one. So, uh, so uh, we ran on the, the, the bare metal, not inside a VM, and that way the data was local, and we, we could take the comp compute to the data. And of course, my poor uh, colleague uh, tested uh, his code, uh, which has to parse HTML. 
And he's like, oh, okay, so here's how I'll avoid having it blow up. I'll cap the input HTML that I send to the parser to only four megabytes. Surely this is good enough. And he ran it on a tiny fraction of the data on a Friday afternoon and saw that it worked. And then he started it up and he left. <laughs> Don't do this. <laughs> so of course what happens is that there are pernicious HTML files that go very deep recursively. And, uh, and, and so that causes the parser to explode. And so it used a lot more memory than was expected and it did not have a memory limit. And so it caused a 15 minute site outage. Don't do this at home. Thank God we're a nonprofit and our users have low expectations. But I hate meeting their low expectations. You always want to do better than that, right? Um, so that's one piece. And then uh, the next piece was, so this Hadoop cluster isn't big enough. And, uh, and even if it was, uh, we have lots of things to do with it too. Um, you know, I have a finite budget for this project. So uh, basically, we, we could only build an index for the home pages of websites, which is, uh, you know, the, 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 the main page, you know, slash on a given uh, web host. And uh, voila. So actually, in a couple days, uh, you'll be able to, to, uh, to use this. We're, we're uh, almost launched, and this is not the final UI. The final UI actually looks like the normal website. Um, and uh, so, you know, you can type in some words. and. Uh, and, and if those words describe an entire website, it's likely that we can successfully land on it. So why have I been striking through the word search? So um, Google has trained everybody that whenever there's a search box, you type some words in, magic happens, and then a great result pops out. And this is really fucking hard. Um, and so you know, that expectation is always there. And so, so uh, for example, in the library world, there you know, having to cope with this, that basically people type in, you know, some words that describe a book. They'll type in some words from a title, maybe the author's first or last name. And then they'll also add some words for what's inside the book. And then there's no results found because the typical library search engine is only card catalog search. So the only data it has is literally the information that would appear on that card in the card catalog if they still had a physical card catalog because they took their existing system and just translated it right into the, into the modern world by digitizing what appears on that card catalog card and not using the full text of the book. And so, so that never works, right? And people expect it to work because of Google, but it would never work. And so we have this same problem that if you type in some words that describe an entire website, like Time Magazine, and then you add a couple words, Justin Bieber, for the articles that you want to see, you're not going to get a result out of this index, but people expect it to work. So this is a big challenge for search, and that's why I always draw a line through search, and we're not going to call it a search engine. So this is, what we're doing is super dumb. But there's some good news and bad news. So we've, we've almost shipped something, um, and it, it looks promising. But we have absolutely no idea in our infrastructure uh, how to scale this to the 482 billion uh, web captures that we have. This is a very big project. So I did the smallish iteration of it, which, you know, it's pretty good, right? In the sense that, uh, let's say, for example, you want to find, uh, you, you used to read, you know, The Rocky, and you lived in Colorado, right? So, so The Rocky is a nickname for The Rocky Mountain News, uh, which was a very popular newspaper that went out of business and their archives disappeared from the web and then some squatter or whatever uh, bought up the domain, and so he's got content on the domain that, that is kind of like local news, and people still come there. But, you know, RockyMountainNews.com, right, that's not, the, that's not what people think of it. They think of it as the Rocky. And uh, so if you search in Google, you can discover, you type in the Rocky, and it, it shows you that RockyMountainNews.com is what, you know, the full domain name is for that. But there are many, many, many websites uh, from the early internet uh, um, that, uh, they're long gone, and, you, and you, you type something into Google, and you get nothing related to what that was. And we can actually find those sites uh, in this index. So that's the, uh, that's the good news. Um, one challenge in our infrastructure, which uh, many, many, many startups uh, have, is that you have a problem that, that looks like it's not that big to start with, um, and it always turns out to be big in the end. So I've, de I've described the Wayback search, but we also have another search that's just over our items. So in our jargon, an item is a, a book or a CD or a movie um, or a, a collection of audio tracks, like, for example, a single Grateful Dead concert. And then all the Grateful Dead concerts are in a collection of Grateful Dead live shows. So we have an, an existing Elasticsearch uh, index that runs over this, and it's only 100 gigabytes in size. And we spent a lot of time 
learning how to deal with Elasticsearch's clustering, and eventually we got this thing working pretty well. Uh, whenever it's down, it causes a site outage. That's kind of unfortunate. Um, so, but, but really, we, we need to go a lot farther because what we did was sort of the, the easiest thing, right? So there's no book text in there. It only has the card catalog information for a book, and it doesn't even have the track names for a CD in this index. So if we indexed sort of some information for every file and not just for the entire item, that would 5x that index. And if we, if we generated algorithmic metadata, so imagine I, I, I took a book and I generated a list of every entity in that book, person, place, or thing, with how important it is to that book, and then index that, that's another 5x. And if I wanted to index additional information for every uh, PDF that I found on the web, which frequently PDFs that you find on the web are things like scientific paper preprints, and it'd be really neat for that to not be locked up inside the Wayback Machine and be able to be visible. That's 5x the number of items. And suddenly we went from this cute little 100 gigabyte index uh, to 12.5 uh, terabytes, and uh, oh my god. And uh, as, a, as, a, as a startup, you have to deal with this uncertainty because you'll discover that even on, if on day one you had some imagination that uh, by year five we're going to grow to this size of data, um, frequently that turns out not to be true. And if you make the mistake of solving the existing problem you have, you may make it uh, impossible to solve the problem you want to have. 125x as much stuff. Um, because you, your initial solution does not easily scale uh, to that scale. So a few getting close to closing remarks. So organizations are made of people. Um, and um, there's a technical de uh, you know, debt uh, aspect to this. People call it technical debt, but it's not really technical debt, right? If I, if I went in tomorrow, so the, the derived system that I described, right, you upload an item and then the derived system does the right thing for that item. It could be transcoding, OCR, whatever. Um, and it's a batch system, and it has, a, it has a, a, a fixed number of slots on a given host, and some of the slots are used by jobs that are not CPU intensive, um, and it fails to then fill up all the CPUs, da-da-da-da-da. Uh, so let's say I wanted to go in and replace that with Apache Mesos. And so the, the challenge there is just to start with, the derived system has 20 years of accreted hacks to make this and that and the other thing work slightly better. Some of those hacks are actually needed, some of them aren't. But the biggest deal is that we have a bunch of people who operate the derived system. And so, you know, for example, today, so somebody created an account and they uploaded 20,000 spam items, right? So there's all these Korean people, marketers, for whatever reason, they think that every place they can upload is a worthy place to upload. So we've got a bunch of people who know how to get rid of that stuff. And there's a bunch of people uploading ISIS recruitment videos to our video collection, which we do not make available to the public. Someday some uh, uh, academic will have a great time uh, studying uh, the world's most comprehensive collection of ISIS recruitment videos, uh, but we're not showing them to the general public. Um, and uh, somebody knows how to deal with that in our existing infrastructure. In fact, we fairly quickly figured that out because we've got one of those accreted hacks is one that figures out that this is an ISIS recruitment video. And so it's, it's those people and those processes which are actually the hardest part, not the technology. Uh, to change. And so uh, if, if, if you call something technical debt, you should keep in mind that frequently there's a person, a people thing that goes along with that. And finally, I will, I will uh, maybe blow your mind with uh, uh, one last demo of something fun you can do in our infrastructure. Um, so we have a lot of content for a lot of books. And generally, as I mentioned, libraries don't do anything with that content. Uh, but, but we do. Um, and so uh, I built this little gizmo that basically uh, it, it takes all the sentences in the uh, 800,000 books that we've scanned. Actually, I only did uh, 80,000 for this particular demo. Um, and it, uh, I picked them by quality. Um, so these are mainly good for historical facts. Um, so for example, high quality is, was published by an academic press. That's one of the signals I use for quality. Um, so I took all the sentences in those books and I took every sentence that mentioned a year and a thing and so you type a thing into this engine, uh, into this engine. and so I picked Joan of Arc um, as my example, um, and it, it shows you a timeline uh, of mentions of Joan of Arc in sentences with dates. So you might be familiar with Google's Ngram Viewer. That tells you the publication date for a book that mentions Joan of Arc. This is actually about her life. So if you look here, this is when she lived, <laughs> and this is modern scholarship about her. And if you click on one of these bars, you end up with 10 sentences, up to 10 sentences from 10 different books 
that have that particular year and Joan of Arc in the sentence. And this is the discovery tool, and this, is the, this type of tool is the fut future of library search, and it's uh, driven by uh, big data. I hope to have nine other interfaces that are kind of cool like this but are different. Um, and this is how you will use books in the uh, 21st century. So that's all the material I have. Anybody have any questions for Greg? I'm going to run. <laughs> okay. Question for Greg. Hi, Greg. Uh, with regard to experiments like the one you worked, you ran on uh, Luxembourgish, are those type of experiment, or even the, the Joan of Arc thing you just did um, mm -hmm. in the last slide, are those type of experiments stuff that anyone can do, or like only you and in-house folks can do? Um, so that's, a, that's an excellent question because we get asked that all the time. There's a lot of aspects about uh, our data that make it very difficult uh, for external people to do those sorts of things. And the Luxembourgish example, uh, Luxembourgish example is uh, great because in order to answer that question, right, uh, I, I need to you know, read 12 petabytes of, of data. So obviously you're not gonna transfer that across a network to a remote site. And our dream is to have a researcher center, to have researchers have enough access um, that they can actually do that sort of stuff by coming and visiting us. Um, another interesting aspect about our stuff, so we are a nonprofit library and that gets us certain legal situations that are very different from other places. And so doing things inside of our infrastructure uh, can be a smart way to access the data um, from a, a legal point of view. And that really applies to the book thing um, so the book thing, so we uh, scan books among other reasons uh, because uh, we would like to support uh, print disabled users. So uh, people who, for example, are, are blind or uh, have a hard time seeing. Um, uh, there's a specific clause in the law that allows nonprofits uh, to scan OCR those books and present them as uh, audio books uh, to uh, anyone uh, who is print disabled. Um, and once that information is on our disks, we can do additional stuff with it, there's a lot of legal precedent now uh, for that. Um, but it's not something that you can really do it outside of our infrastructure, again, for legal reasons. So that, that book thing that I showed you was actually a project that I did as a volunteer before I joined the Internet Archive full time. Um, I signed in blood you know, a, a thing that said that I wasn't gonna take you know, the wrong data outside of the infrastructure. They gave me a VM uh, on a machine that was inside um, and I downloaded a bunch of stuff um, and, I, and I had to have special privileges in order to download that content because it's inside only um, content. So there's a, a, so it's not only data size, there's also policy issues uh, around the variety of data we have and the various copyrights that apply uh, to that data that drive its partial accessibility. So there's a lot of stuff that you can, you know, just download from the, the Internet Archive and people, people do that all the time and write papers about it and that's super great. Uh, we would love uh, to eventually give access, to that same level, level of access inside of our infrastructure uh, for in, uh, information that's bound up by these policy issues. On a, on a following note, uh, last year, the NOAA, NOAA, had an agreement with the big five cloud providers to sync NOAA's data to the cloud providers. Mm -hmm. um, do you have something like that? Does Internet Archive or something like that? So we're interested in... Uh, uh, that, that type of data, um, it can be extremely large, as you know. And it, it turns out that uh, my uh, previous uh, life, uh, I was a supercomputing guy, and I spent a lot of time uh, dealing with weather forecasting and climate. <laughs> and uh, so they have, a, the, a particularly the satellite uh, observations of uh, uh, surface temperatures, sea surface height, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that, that's a, a lot of data. Um, and so it uh, is much larger. The full set of data is much larger than our entire infrastructure and they you know, store it on tape. Um, uh, so we're super interested. We have some things going on uh, in that arena where basically we would love to be able to take uh, a science uh, paper, the code and the data that went along with it, as long as it's not too big, and make that available as a bundle um, on the archive. Um, it's something that a lot of uh, people publishing papers wanna do. A lot of the folks that hand out money for science want that, all that information to be available and not just the end paper. 
Um, so we're very interested in that, but we haven't done very much with it yet. But it's an active area of discussion, and we hope actually in a few months we'll probably have an announcement along those lines. Because people, of course, they ask us about it all the time, because uh, you know we want to make you know universal access to human knowledge, and that's definitely a big chunk of human knowledge. But just just like video, the sheer size of a lot of data sets is a big challenge for us and other people. Anybody else have a question for Greg? Awesome. And, uh, you know, thanks, Greg, for giving me another time suck. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Cool. So, guys, I want to head back in here whenever you get a chance. Hopefully, you enjoyed the lunch. Um, we have, like, like Laura was saying, we have three speakers this afternoon all talking, again, on big data, staying on theme. And first to kick us off here is, is Matt Winkler. So Matt is a Microsoft employee as well, and he gets to do some really cool stuff. When we talk about big data, everybody's talking about petabytes and larger data stores. So Matt works on a team and oversees a team that actually handles things on the exabyte level. So we're talking lots and lots of data. So Matt, go ahead and take it away and tell us all of your secrets. OK. Awesome. awesome. Am I talk? OK, great. OK, cool. So thank you, Andrew, for the intro. Uh, my name is Matt Winkler. I'm a group program manager at Microsoft. Uh, and that means I get to hang out uh, with the engineering team, talking to customers, figuring out what we're going to go build. Uh, I've been working on the big data team at Microsoft for about the last five years or so. Uh, on different pieces and parts of it, our Hadoop stack as well as our internal things. Uh, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing with big data inside of Microsoft. Uh, and I'll talk about how that's shaping some of the things that we're doing externally that you can go play with uh, in Azure. So quick level setting, uh, show of hands. How many folks are working with big data systems today? Okay. Uh, Hadoop? Couple. Spark? OK, a different set of couple, but roughly about the same size. Uh, Redshift, OK, BigQuery, couple, couple. OK, cool. All right, I see, I see a few. Uh, and so we will uh, get started on this path. Uh, if there's any questions along the way, just fire away. Um, we can kind of take this wherever, wherever you guys want to take it. Um, but I'd like to start off with a question, which is, how do we go about building something like Bing? Uh, if you think about the big data technologies, uh, whether you think about uh, Hadoop or you think about some of the things we're doing, a lot of it originated in this place, which is web search. And previous speaker talked a little bit about some of the challenges of this. Uh, but if you think about it, what all goes into building a search engine? Uh, so I want to walk up in my browser. I want to go to a search engine of my choice. Uh, I'm going to go to Bing uh, and type in something like sushi in Tokyo. I typed this in when I was in Tokyo because I was looking for a place to go get sushi. And a couple of things are important here. The first is you actually need an index of the internet. And so that begets this problem of how do you get a copy of the internet, how do you store it, and how do you do compute on top of it? And that's really the, the genesis. If you go read the, uh, the GFS paper, if you read the MapReduce paper, they all started from this same place, which is how do I go store a bunch of unstructured stuff pretty cheaply, but be able to build interesting things on top of it. And in terms of the interesting things, this has evolved. So it started off with, hey, I just need an index so that if I can find all the web pages that say both Sushi and Tokyo. But that's evolved a lot more now because I need to focus on, hey, how do I actually find a relevant search result? How can I measure when somebody clicks through? Are they actually satisfied with that? So, the types of processing we've done on top of that starts to get more and more sophisticated. The other thing that happens, and sometimes people will talk about this in terms of the, the various Vs around big data, but I want to have awareness of context. So in real time, when I did this search sitting in Tokyo, it's actually pretty relevant to me that I'm sitting in Tokyo. If I type this query in when I'm sitting in San Francisco, it doesn't really do a lot of good for, to pop up a map of a sushi place down the street because I'm typing sushi in Tokyo. But if I'm in Tokyo, that's really interesting. I want to be able to see, hey, um, down the street from your hotel is a five-star sushi place. And so in order to do that at Microsoft, we built this system called Cosmos. Uh, and Cosmos started out life serving that purpose of how do I take copies of the internet 
and enable the people building our search engine to create indices and do relevance and do fraud detection and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but it's evolved a lot since then. And it's become our internal platform for building big data applications. Uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that all of Microsoft runs on top of Cosmos. Uh, it's an exabyte scale store. Uh, it runs across hundreds of thousands of machines. So it's one of the biggest big data systems that we know of. Um, you know, we know folks at some other companies have systems that are of similar scale. Uh, but every business at Microsoft uses data that lives in Cosmos. Uh, you know, all of the telemetry that comes off of the Surface devices, all of the application telemetry coming from Office or Windows, all of these things land inside of Cosmos. And it's been really interesting because it's allowed us to see how an organization can evolve when they've got access to a whole lot of data. And so let me just talk about a couple of uh, key scenarios that we see. Uh, these are these are use cases that we see inside with Cosmos. These are use cases that we see all of our customers doing. For those of you that raised your hands and said, yes, I'm doing some big data stuff, you're probably doing one of these. Uh, log processing, this is kind of the bread and butter. Um, but this is incredibly useful um, because there's logs getting generated everywhere. Um, we have folks in our data center operations teams that are getting the logs off of all of the individual sensors inside of the you know, millions of servers that we've got. And so that's not just a signal from a server, that's a signal from the temperature gauge that's sitting on the fan on one of the two CPU slots. And so all of those things are generating lots and lots of interesting data that we can then take, we can put into the system, and we can start to do some interesting things on top of it. The next thing that we see is, once you have that, is really moving more into data mining. <clears throat> and typically what we're doing here is taking a large corpus of unstructured data or data that's you know, at a very, very fine granularity, you know, the 25 millisecond interval of that temperature gauge sitting on one of the CPU slots in one of the servers. Uh, and we actually want to build out the set of analytics and reports that other folks are going to use. And you know, typically these are things, they're producing data sets that someone else will consume in a tool like Excel, will consume in a tool like Tableau. Um, it may actually just be producing other files that more systems are going to consume downstream. But this data mining um, is a pattern that we see, you know, it's not just doing this on top of the index of the internet, we're doing this on top of lots and lots of other data sources, and we're joining across those. Another use case that we see is really about curating the data, which is about taking a data set, maybe multiple data sets, combining it, massaging it, moving it, and producing it for another application to use. Uh, and so here, this is kind of the canonical case that we see of, hey, I'm going to go process the internet. I'm going to generate an index. Now, nobody's going to open the index in Excel or Tableau and mess around with it. What that's actually producing is, hey, what's the data file and the formats that we need to push up to the index machines that are actually serving the search results for Bing? The final use case that we see a lot of, uh, and Andrew mentioned this this morning, is, is really around machine learning. And we see this happening in two, in two different ways. The first is when you have this big giant data set, it may be very, very useful to train models and algorithms on all of that data. So when we can look at all of the web pages, we can find, hey, what are the ones that we think are spammy? Or malware uh, is a common uh, use case that we see, where we're trying to find that. Because we want to be able to predict inside the browser, hey, uh, is this web page you know, someplace I should pop up a warning display and say, hey, you probably shouldn't go browse here. Um, you know, what that requires is an algorithm that we can take the web page and say, hey, do we think this is spam? This is malware, yes or no? Well, the more data that we have, the better model that we can build. And so a lot of times what we're doing is we're training these models on top of all of this data that we've collected. The other use case that we see here is taking these models and then using them within our data pipelines. Right? So the common case here is I have another system or another data pipeline that's processing, again, kind of all of the pages on the internet that wants to use this model to say, hey, 
I've already created a model that predicts, is this a, a malware-infected web page, yes or no? Great. When I run this query, I want to actually query against this and say, hey, for all you know, 250 million pages, which are the ones that we think are, are malware? And so those are a couple of the use cases that we see people inside of Microsoft doing. Um, and you know, the, the, the one thing, when we look back on kind of the growth over the last 10 years or so uh, of Cosmos, uh, the thing that's really enabled the growth here is around sharing of data. Um, and this has been incredibly powerful, because what it allows all of us to do inside the company is to, is to very, very easily, without a whole lot of friction, access other pieces and parts of data. Uh, or access data from other pieces and parts of the company. And so kind of my example of this is uh, when I was working on HD Insight, which is our Hadoop service, and Maxim will talk about that a little bit later, um, I had a bunch of web logs, which were all of the HTTP traffic that was coming into all of our, uh, all of the Hadoop clusters that we had deployed. And I wanted to understand where were people coming from. And so I had your typical you know, web server web logs that have, hey, I requested this page at this time and from this IP address. Uh, and so I sent an email out to Cosmos Discussion. That's an internal alias at Microsoft. And I said, hey, does somebody have uh, a data set which is a mapping from an IP address to a lat long? Because I wanted to understand where were these things happening. Uh, and about 25 minutes later, I got an email back saying, oh, yeah, we've got this data over here. Let me share it with you. And so because we all sit inside the same uh, identity system, this person was able to grant me access to that data set. And then about 20 minutes later, I was able to join all of my web logs from the service with this data set that said, hey, if it's this IP address, it's this location in Ohio. I was able to do a join on those two data sets and then produce where all, where's all of my traffic coming from, right? And what that then allowed me to do is now I've produced an interesting data set that someone else can come and ask me and say, hey, I want to understand the customer base for HD Insight. Where is all this data coming? Where are all these people coming from? I can then share that with them. And so the thing that we really saw just take the, the usage curve and shoot it straight up was around this notion of being able to very easily share data. And in a company like Microsoft, we obviously have a fair amount of uh, compliance constraints uh, within the company, we have to be able to do this securely. Um, it would not be good if the marketing folks can get access to all of the data that the finance folks have, right? And so there's this notion of being able to share this data, but do it in a compliant way, do it in a way that we can audit it. Uh, that's, that's pretty important as we create this giant data lake for the whole company. So that's a little bit uh, about Cosmos. Um, what we've been up to lately has been taking a lot of the things that we've learned from Cosmos, and we're applying that to the services that we're building in Azure uh, so that it's not just folks inside of Microsoft that can take advantage of that. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about those. Um, and we call these services the Data Lake services. Uh, there are three of them, the Data Lake Store, HD Insight, and the Analytics Service. And let me talk about each one of these. These are all available in Azure today. Uh, how many folks have an Azure subscription? Couple, OK. Um, I'm sure there's some folks in the room that can hook you up with one if you'd like one. Uh, OK, good, great. We've got one more. OK, yes. But let me talk a little bit about these. And these are available. You can start using these today. Um, the first one is something that we call Data Lake Store. Uh, and the reason that we built this is that we see Particularly in the cloud, uh, a lot of folks are moving big data workloads to the cloud because it allows them to separate their compute from their storage. And at first, a lot of people who are familiar with, with, with Hadoop will say, but wait, I thought Hadoop was all about co-locating compute and storage together. Uh, and that's great, but what that also means is a lot of times we see people who they have to size their Hadoop clusters based solely on the amount of data that they have not necessarily how much compute that they want to be able to do. 
Uh, and so <coughs> if you double the amount of data, you need to double the size of your cluster. Well, in the cloud, you can separate those two concerns. And this is not just something that Microsoft is doing. If you look at what Amazon's doing with EMR, if you look at what Google's doing, all, all of the big cloud providers are doing this because what it allows you to do is say, hey, I'm going to put as much data as I want into the cloud storage system, and then I'm going to bring exactly the amount of compute that I need to that. And so, for instance, we have a lot of customers that will say, look, I need to size my Hadoop cluster for doing about 90 days worth of processing. I always need to be able to process the last quarter's worth of data. And there's probably three or four times a year I actually need to process the whole year's data. Well, if you think about doing that in, uh, in your own data center, you basically have to provision the capacity for, hey, that time, those three or four times where you need to run all of those queries, which means you're going to be pretty underutilized from an efficiency perspective on the bulk of that cluster. What we can do in the cloud is say, hey, great, run your cluster that's sized to your 90 days worth of work, uh, but then when, when you need more computing power, that's great. Go ahead, scale that up, run the experiments over all of your data, and then you'll be fine. Um, and so we started with observing this pattern that in the cloud, separating compute and storage makes a lot of sense for the big data workloads. Um, and so we built Data Lake Store. The three interesting things about it um, were the first is we noticed with a lot of cloud storage solutions, they're really great general purpose storage solutions. Um, but in order to be a great general purpose solution, when you start doing things like, hey, I'd like to have a thousand nodes of a Hadoop cluster banging on this thing at the same time, there are limits that are put in place that make it a great general purpose store, not as great for analytics. And so the first thing that we, the first design point that we had for this was really around not having any user facing limits. And so what I mean by this is, there's not a limit on how big of a file you can write here. There's not a limit on how large a, a single storage account can be. And so we've tested this. We've had multi-petabyte size files uh, inside the store. And the account is really it's limited by the number of hard drives that we have inside of an Azure data center, which hopefully we're buying enough of them that we never run out. Um, but the reason that that's important is we find customers will design around the limitations of a storage system. But what that means is, oh, now I have to remember when I want to run my query over the big table, I have to join together two different storage accounts. Right? It puts a tax on the people up in the stack who are just, I'm just trying to write a query. I want to understand all the Luxembourgese uh, language pages that show up in my internet archive. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing that we've done that's interesting with the store is that we've built um, the security model so that it's integrated with OAuth. Uh, and what that means is you can take your identity and have file and folder level access control based on that identity. And so this is really cool for that sharing scenario. And what this means is I can walk up to my Data Lake Store account and I can say, hey, I would like to share this folder with Maxim. <clears throat> and since Maxim and I are both on the Microsoft network, I have to, you know, I have to know Maxim's email address and then I can grant Maxim read access or write access or read and write access to that data. The final thing that's interesting about this, uh, and this also kind of speaks to how much Hadoop has influenced the way we think about doing big data at Microsoft, is the API for this. So rather than build out a, a, our own file system API, the API on this is HDFS. And so what that means is anything that can speak HDFS which is the Hadoop distributed file system, which is pretty much every big data project on the planet, can read or write data into the store. And so that means the number of tools that you can use with this is pretty broad. And it also means you don't have to use the tools that Microsoft's built. If you want to use Apache Flink, uh, which is you know, the next version of, uh, of Spark, or the European Spark, depending upon who you talk to, um, great. Flink pulls in from the HDFS project, that's going to pull in the ability to access this store. So that's the Data Lake store. The next service is uh, HD Insight. And HD Insight's our managed Hadoop service. And what I mean by managed is, 
at, we take care of deploying it, running it. Uh, if something breaks at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's somebody on my team that gets a phone call so that our customers don't have to worry about having an ops team to go run their giant cluster. Um, this supports all of the major uh, Hadoop projects, so Pig, Hive, Uzi, uh, Mahout, Storm, HBase, Spark. We can keep going with a bunch of these. Uh, we could even probably name a couple that are, uh, you know, bitter uh, French existentialists. Um, but that all runs inside of HD Insight. And what that means is you can walk up to Azure and you can say, hey, uh, I'd like a Spark cluster that's 200 nodes, click go. And in just a little bit of time, you'll get a cluster that's fully up and running. You can scale it up and down. Um, and if it breaks at 3 in the morning, just, you know, we take care of it. The other thing that's interesting about this is it's also fully supported. Uh, and so what that means is at 3 o'clock in the morning, if your Spark query is running slow, you can call Microsoft and say, hey, guys, my Spark query is running really slow. Can you please help me? And we'll, we'll take care of that and we'll fix it. Um, and that's just different than the model of if you buy Hadoop uh, on-prem, which is you typically have to pay for a, a Hadoop-specific support contract to go with that. The other thing uh, about HD Insight, it runs on both Windows and Linux. Uh, so if you're more comfortable uh, running your big data system on top of Linux, that's fine. We fully support that running on top of Ubuntu. Uh, and all of the things that I just said about we wake up at 3 in the morning, you can call us at 3 in the morning, uh, apply both to Windows and Linux <coughs> there. The final service is the analytics service. And we really think of the analytics service as the evolution of big data processing that's really built for the cloud. Uh, and what I mean by that is HD Insight is a cluster service. You walk up, you deploy a cluster. That's the thing that's up and running. It's up to you to use it efficiently. Uh, if you deploy a cluster and never do anything with it, um, we're totally okay with that. You probably won't be okay with it when your bill comes because you're running a cluster and you're not doing anything with it. The analytics service is a job service, which means it doesn't cost anything until you actually tell it to go do some work and tell it to go run a job. Uh, and so the analytics service is really a pay-per-use, scale-on-demand service. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. The other thing that's uh, important to point out here is that this doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, and so we've got partnerships and we work very, very closely with pretty much everyone in the big data space. Um, if anyone out here is building a tool for the Hadoop ecosystem or a platform that sits on top of Hadoop, please come talk to me afterwards. We would love to get you up on this slide as well. Um, and you know, this really ranges from working with all of the major Hadoop vendors, Cloudera, Hortonworks, and MapR, to make sure that they deploy great inside of Azure. It means working with all of the BI vendors. So uh, Microsoft's BI offering is Power BI. They actually sit two floors above us uh, up in Redmond, so we have to be pretty nice to them. Um, but we also know that a lot of folks are coming to us and saying, hey, I like the Hadoop thing. I'm running Tableau. Great. We've gone. We've done a deal with Tableau. You can actually go into Tableau. There's a drop down that says, Yes, I want to point this to Spark running on HD Insight, and that'll just work. Uh, the other thing that we're doing, so beyond BI, is there's an entire ecosystem of folks that are building applications for Hadoop. This is folks like uh, Trifacta and Datamir and Waterline and Concurrent and DataTorrent. And they've got interesting offerings, which are uh, apps that deploy on top of a Hadoop cluster. A lot easier to use around a certain set of scenarios um, because not everybody on the planet wants to write MapReduce code. Um, and what we've done for all of these is if you walk up to the Azure portal and type in Datamir, we actually have a one click template that lets you say, hey, I'd like to deploy a fully configured Hadoop cluster inside of HD Insight that's also fully configured and running Datamir. Uh, and so that means you can just get up and running with that. Uh, we can also deploy other applications as well. So again, if you're building an app for the Hadoop space or the Spark space, please come talk to me afterwards. Any questions on any of this? <coughs> okay. 
So I want to talk a little bit uh, about Azure Data Lake Analytics, um, because this is where a lot of the learnings that we've taken from Cosmos are starting to surface inside, the, inside, inside of Azure for you to take advantage of. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is really about a job service, which lets you walk up and say, hey, now I want to start doing some interesting processing. Uh, and every time you submit a job, we've got a little slider that lets you say, hey, how much compute power do you want to use on this job? Um, this is built on top of the same things that we're using in Cosmos that will scale to jobs that run on top of tens of thousands of nodes. Uh, and so we're, we're ready for <laughs> whatever you want to throw at us. The other thing that's interesting here, kind of going back to that same point I made with uh, Data Lake Store and us leveraging HDFS as the API service there, the analytics service is built on top of Yarn. And so Yarn is uh, yet another resource negotiator. It's the resource management layer for Hadoop. And the way to think about it is the resource manager is the thing inside the cluster when something says, I need 25 nodes to go run this part of my job. You need to uh, reach out to the resource manager and say, hey, resource manager, I need 25 nodes. I want them to look like this. I need containers that have about this much RAM. And then the resource manager's job is to say, OK, great. Here's a container. Here's a container. Here's a container. Hands that back to the application, like Spark or Hive or uSQL. Uh, and then that job can actually run. And so we've actually built the Data Lake Analytics system service on top of Yarn as our resource manager. And so we're actually a fairly large contributor back to the Yarn project, doing things around federation and around pretty massive scale. Because right now, Yarn will top out in the five to 10,000 node range. Um, we're looking at some fixes on that that will take it to about the 50 to 60,000 node range by federating across lots of little smaller Yarn clusters. The final thing that's kind of interesting and what I'll kind of finish the talk with is this is also where we've got a new language for big data called uSQL. And I want to talk a little bit about that, um, that next. <coughs> but first, we'll do a quick demo. And so we'll get started. Uh, so this is the Azure portal. Um, this is kind of the pane of glass for everything that you've got up and running in Azure. And what I'm going to actually do is go to my uh, analytics account. And what you can see here, this lets me see, hey, what's the load on the system? Um, I haven't done much lately. Uh, what are all the jobs that have run? And I just want to show how easy it is to get started with this. And so again, you can walk up to Azure. You can say, hey, please create a Data Lake Analytics account. It doesn't cost anything. It only costs something when you run a job. It takes about a minute to create. But when I want to run a job, I'm just going to go here to a sample job. I'm going to query a tab delimited file. And what you'll see here, this is, the, this is a super simple uSQL program that copies from one file and writes to another. So this is a massive abuse of a distributed big data system. Um, but it's good for a sample. And the important thing here is this slider. And what this slider allows me to do is say, how much parallelism do I want here? And you can think about this as corresponding to how many machines do I want to run this across? Um, I think my account, um, they've limited me to about 250. Um, that's probably all I need to copy a 700 kilobyte file from one place to another, uh, which is all that sample job does. Um, but this is something that this can scale arbitrarily large. Uh, and in the second half, I'll actually show some tools to help you figure out how much, like where you should set that slider. And so if I click go, that job's going to kick off and start running. <coughs> so let's talk about uh, uSQL. Um, and the origin of uSQL is actually a language that we're using internally called Scope. Uh, we published a research paper on Scope uh, about five years ago um, that talks a little bit about the origins of the language. I'm happy to share this link with folks uh, if you'd like to read the paper. Uh, you know, the, the, the key thing, kind of the difference between uh, Scope and MapReduce, um, on the surface, there's a lot of differences in terms of how someone programs it. 
But scope has always been based on a DAG-based scheduler, a directed uh, acyclic graph scheduler, as opposed to MapReduce, which is really kind of jobs split up into these map and reduce phases. The DAG scheduling mechanism is the same thing that you see inside of Tez. It's the same thing that you see inside of Spark. Uh, and so there's a lot of interesting optimizations that we can do. The other thing that's worth pointing out here is that in any given month, there are thousands and thousands of folks inside of Microsoft that are writing scope scripts. Uh, and they're writing them on some massive data sets. Some of these, jo these scope jobs that are written by the Bing team scale out across tens of thousands of nodes. And so it's been kind of fun to sit back and watch all of the things that break when people do that and all of the tools and the th things that people need in order to be productive. So the typical question when you stand up in front of a crowd and say, hey, we've introduced a new language, is why a new language? Um, and really, if you think about the two different ways that people are programming big data, um, the first is kind of a code-based approach that could be uh, MapReduce that could be cascading or scalding, that could be Spark or Flink. Um, the nice thing about code-based approaches is you get a ton of control, right? Because you're writing code. Um, the downside for a lot of code-based approaches is you're writing a lot of code. And so typically the person who's writing that job has to be a developer. Um, you know, we're not going to go teach a bunch of business analysts how to write Scala. Um, the other thing with a code-based approach is because you get so much control, at times it can be very, very difficult to optimize, right? Because essentially you have these large opaque chunks of random stuff that you've tossed into the system. So one thing that's been really, really popular starting all the way back from, you know, Facebook's work with Hive has been a SQL-based approach. Why do folks like SQL? Because everybody knows how to write SQL. And if you don't know how to write SQL, that's fine. There's lots of tools that know how to write SQL. Uh, and so there's a ton of familiarity with SQL. There's also a lot of history that we've got, decades and decades of experience of taking select from where group by and doing optimizations on that. Um, you know, the University of Wisconsin at Madison produces tens and tens of graduates every year that are, get PhDs simply down this path. The downside with a lot of these approaches, so these have been really popular in the big data space, what we've seen people struggle with here is that it's very, very hard to extend <coughs> and then it's also a bit of a challenge when you want to do more complex processing that, that goes beyond just a single query. And so this is how we came up with scope, which is you know, the origin for uSQL. And the way to think about this is start off with SQL that everybody knows and loves. All of the SQL constructs that you're familiar with, select, group by, projections, filters, um, all of those things, we start out there. The next thing that we do is add data flow constructs to the language. And this is really important because most big data jobs, if you think about that data mining or that data curation, it's not one query. You're going to write a series of stages. And so you actually want to chain those together in a data flow. And it's important to put them in the same data flow because then you can actually look across the graph of all of those operators and then we can do lots of optimization tricks on that. If it turns out I only ever need at the very end three columns, and I have the whole graph, I can push that all the way back up to the beginning so that when I'm reading the data from disk, I only pull in the three columns I need. That's an example of a really simple um, optimization that we can do, but when you have that whole data flow graph, that makes it interesting. And so if you look at the code sample on the right, you see that where I'm taking these individual queries and I'm building on the query that I wrote before. The next thing is we know that with a big data system, you're operating on top of all different types of data. And so the next thing that we add is the ability to support unstructured data sources, and we want to make that extensible. And so you can see that here, hey, I'm going to extract these four columns. So I'm asserting some schema when I read these four from this file. It doesn't have to be a file. It could be a folder. It could be lots and lots of files. Um, and how am I going to do that? I'm going to use our CSV extractor. Well, all an extractor is is a type that we author some of them and you can author your own. Uh, and so inside the company, we have one of these that can read Xbox memory dumps. If you think about when something goes catastrophically wrong with an Xbox, sends a memory dump, we can actually write SQL statements on top of that because somebody's gone in and they've written an extractor for that. 
The next thing that we added is the ability to do federated query across data sources. And this is really important because we see a lot of people have not just data sitting in a bunch of random files, they're going to have some data sitting inside of a relational store. You know, the common example here is I've got all of my web traffic data in log files that I want to process, but then I've got my customer data sitting inside of a, a database. And so typically the workflow is okay, go ahead and do an export from the database, which typically, at least for me, involves at least three to five different searches on a search engine to remember what's the exact syntax to dump the file out. I need to take that file, I need to upload it into my Hadoop cluster, my big data system. I need to then figure out how to join these two things together. Um, and then I might find out that I had something interesting. Uh, and so that, that, if you go back to that kind of point I was making about productivity, that's a tax on the developer, right? You have to go remember how to export. And if you do something interesting there, then you have another problem, which is great. Now, every night, I want to take an updated copy of that customer table because I'm going to have changes to it, and I want to import that. Now I have to schedule, and I have to do workflow. I have to do all sorts of stuff. Uh, and so we've added the ability to, from the language, query other sources, whether that's blob store or whether that's SQL-based serv servers. The final thing that we add that's, that really starts to make this different than what uh, a lot of the uh, languages and tools that we have right now is that we've made it so you can very, very easily include user code. And what I mean by that is let's look at this line right here. And so what this actually allows me to do is treat th the tweet variable as a .NET string. And so all of this code to the right here, dot .split, where, that's just C-sharp code. And so this, to me, as a developer, I'm a lot more familiar with this than I am trying to remember what are the SQL string manipulation constructs. That's another two to three web searches that land somewhere on Stack Overflow um, for me to do this. And what this allows me to do is very, very easily, for something that is better expressed in procedural code, I can just go ahead and write this in line. And then we'll go ahead and take care of scaling that out across a bunch of other nodes. So we take all those things, we put them together, and that is uh, uSQL. And so what I want to close off with here is I want to show um, an interesting uSQL query and then show a little bit of some of the tools that we have. And so what I have here. Uh, I'm sitting inside of Visual Studio. This is actually uh, a query that I wrote that queries all of the HTTP traffic that comes to the Data Lake Analytics service. Because again, what I'm trying to do here is understand um, the distribution of latencies that customers are seeing. Because I want to understand, hey, on a given operation, how bad of an experience is someone getting at the 95th or the 99th percentile? And so what this allows me to do is I'm going to read in all of this data from all of our HTTP logs. I'm going to extract it using an extractor that we've built that knows how to parse the log format that we're using inside the service. And then what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start building up and doing multiple stages of transforms. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to filter out um, things that have uh, bad dates. Uh, for a while, we had one component that was outputting stuff into the logs with a bad date format. So I want to get rid of all those. Not only do I want to get rid of those for the rest of my query, for this bottom query, what I'm actually doing is saying, hey, I actually want to look at all of those bad records. Uh, because I actually do want to find out what component is outputting this stuff, because that's not a good state of the system. So I actually want to go look at the bad records, too. But that's not as important for my job. So I take that and I output the bad uh, front end events. And I continue to build this query up where I'm filtering out um, and reducing that data set until ultimately, let me scroll down here a little bit further, I'm doing some fairly advanced SQL on this using all of the analytic functions that live inside a SQL. And so what I'm doing here is I'm saying, hey, on a given business week, um, per operation, compute 
you know, six percentiles, six different percentiles uh, of the latency. And the cool thing about this is this is the same code that I'd write if I was querying data sitting inside of a SQL Server or Oracle. It's also copy and pasted from a Hive query that I have that does the same thing. Uh, and so this is where being based on SQL and being familiar to folks who know SQL is a really nice advantage. OK, and then I'm going to do some more stuff. <coughs> when I submit this, uh, I ran this job. This job took about five hours to run on top of all the data that we have. What you'll see here is I've got a, uh, this is the, the directed graph of the various stages of the job. And we can zoom in on it. We could kind of check out what the individual boxes are here. But they're the different stages of the query. Uh, and I can see what's the input. I'm reading from you know, 2,000 distinct files. What's the output look like for each of those output statements? I've got that. And we can do a couple of interesting things here. Um, the first is we can actually play this back. And when I play it back, what that's going to do is take that five-hour job and run it in about 30 seconds. And as it's running, what I can do is apply different heat maps on top of it. So I can see, hey, where am I spending the most time on data read? Where am I spending the most time on execution time? And the important thing to see here is, you go down here, what you actually see is, hey, it doesn't look like the graph's changing. And that is because we've got a data skew issue that's causing this one calculation to take a really, really long time. And so this is kind of a hint for me to go back and either see if something's wrong with my query or see if there's some data skew that I can, go, that I can deal with. Now, the reason that this is interesting, and I talked earlier about the, the tools to understand where to set the slider, is we gather all of the metadata that occurred when this job was executing, and we can go do some interesting things with that. So I can walk up to the Diagnostics tab here, and I can say, I'd like to go to the Usage Modeler. And what this allows me to do is trade off the amount of parallelism with how long my job's going to run. And so it estimates that if I set the slider to 5,200, um, that would be the most efficient way to get my job to execute in 15,000 seconds. But what if I put that at 100? Well, what this says is now that's going to execute in about 24,000 seconds. But the really important thing here is that data skew that I was talking about. Very early, for the first half of my job, I'm actually almost 100% efficient. I'm using all 200, or in this case, I'm using all 100 nodes that I would throw at this job. But as we get towards the end, <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm becoming less efficient here. Uh, and so this, this, these types of tools let me very easily trade off, hey, do I want to set the slider really far over to the right? It's going to cost me more money, but it might get my job done faster. Uh, or you know what? I run this job once a night. It doesn't need to be done until everybody shows up at 8 o'clock the next morning. Gosh, I don't need to allocate all of these machines. I can allocate 10, 10 uh, and I'll run that. Um, and so these are some of the things that we've got for optimizing the job um, that hangs out inside of uh, Visual Studio. And so with that, um, I'm six minutes over. Uh, so I will draw to a conclusion. I've got a couple of resources. Um, so if you're interested in the language, go to usql.io. Um, that's kind of our base landing zone for the language. Uh, all, or go to azure.com, and you can search for the various uh, data lake services. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, putting up with me for the last uh, 46 minutes. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, fire away now, or I'll be hanging out in the back uh, a little later. Questions for Matt? Just, just mob him later. That'll be fine. Fire away. And thank you yeah, for flying yeah. down. Oh, yeah. Much appreciated.
So um, thanks, Matt, for awesome talk there. Our next speaker is going to be Maxim Lu Lukianov, who's uh, also a PM here at Microsoft. And he's been focusing a lot on HBase in the past, but now he's actually overseeing a lot of our Spark business and going to be talking a little bit today about how you can use Spark and what we're doing with Spark um, internally. Little known fact, his favorite animal is a hummingbird. Have you ever seen a hummingbird? They're kind of cool. There's a cool TED talk out there um, about hummingbirds with DARPA. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but they created a hummingbird-like robot that could fly around. So if you ever do have hummingbirds, make sure you look twice for the red eyes, because if it's a robot, it could be listening. You ever seen Person of Interest? Anybody watch that TV show? Um, I feel like that's, that's how they get all the information. Basically, they build a huge big data model that's able to find every single person um, and see if they're committing, committing crimes. Really, that's how DARPA does it. They just use hummingbirds. Anyway, I digress. Um, I'm going to get off stage now and let Maxim uh, go ahead and talk to you guys. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, can you hear me? Great. Yeah, now, now I'll keep thinking about hummingbirds. I have three near my house. How do I recognize? I have three near my house. Three hummingbirds? Yes. So Maybe one hummingbird and two robots. Maybe. <laughs> How will I recognize your eyes? Oh, man. Okay. So one second, please. Let me just move things around. Okay, so I'm Maxim Lukianov. I'm program manager in big data team. Uh, Matt is my colleague. Uh, I'm working on the HD inside side of the service. So as Matt said, there is a big data, uh, sorry, Azure Data Lake service that consists of three pieces. Data Lake Analytics, Data Lake Store, and HD inside, which are man managed clusters. So I'm working on the Spark uh, clusters. And in this talk, we will uh, basically go through the journey of how we can take an uh, open source Spark and make it uh, as a solution for your interactive big data. So we'll start with a little bit of Spark intro. Uh, how many, again, uh, of you are familiar with Spark? Uh, not everybody, let's say a minority. So yeah, we'll do a really quick introduction. There are uh, lots of resources on Spark, so if you want to kind of uh, get better, deeper introduction, please uh, feel free to uh, go on, on the edX uh, or our, on to our Azure uh, documentation site. We have great resources. So uh, Spark is a shiny new thing in a big data world. Uh, if you're following big data and you're attending conferences, like right now we are having mini conference, conference on big data, uh, then you know that there are many of them. And one of the biggest ones is uh, Strata. So a year ago, I've, I've been at Strata, and Spark was big news at that time. Uh, everybody was having sessions about it. Everybody was excited. So that was big kind of beginning of adoption for Spark. But this year, Strata, the situation has changed. Uh, Spark is no longer news, but if you go to big data uh, application vendors, ISV vendors, or uh, big companies, you'll find Spark incorporated into the pitch deck or into their product. So Spark is almost everywhere. So Spark is becoming kind of a new uh, standard in big data industry. And there are many reasons for that. It has great uh, ecosystem, uh, very active community, uh, and uh, the community around Spark has managed to put out very rapid cadence of releases. Every three months, there is a major update with great new functionalities. Like in the upcoming Spark 2.0, there will be new revamp uh, on performance with a project, so-called Project Tungsten, that will bring even more performance to Spark. There is a revamp of the streaming technology in Spark. So it's uh, moving forward fast, and it's uh, generating uh, a lot of momentum around it. So what is so great about Spark that uh, kind of attracted all of this attention? 
so if you uh, go around during Hadoop times, you know that Hadoop ecosystem is very rich, and it's, it really started a kind of big data movement. But what was also true about Hadoop is that if you wanted to do particular thing like machine learning or SQL or just import export data from SQL database or anything else, you would need to learn a new tool every time you try to do something new. And that is changing with Spark. In Spark, uh, it provides kind of a more generic uh, execution engine that is, as Matt mentioned, is based on the directed, directed, sorry, directed acyclic graphs, DAGs, uh, that is, that are generic enough so these workloads that run on top of Spark, like SQL or machine learning or graph processing, can actually compile down or express the intent in the form of the Spark DAGs, and that allows end users to benefit by learning less number of concepts, and for the overall system to benefit from enhancements to the core of Spark. Like every time there is the Spark core becomes faster, all these workloads that use it become faster as well. So this moves us from this quite chaotic world of Hadoop into a more structured and, uh, I would say, elegant world of Spark. But what is important for, for our talk today is that Spark brings with it not only enhanced performance and kind of elegance of architecture, it also is good enough already uh, to start working with your big data in an interactive way. And uh, when we talk to our customers and we did various studies what we learned from them uh, across major, uh, many, many sources of their frustrations and desires, one theme popped out to the top across all of the developers and data analysts, is that the, the biggest thing that drives their success and even happiness is the length of the development cycle. So if you make a system where development cycle becomes shorter and faster, their productivity rises, and that is a kind of primary proxy to, to, to productivity itself and to a satisfaction with their job. So this focus on reducing development cycle in order to make developers productive is what drove kind of our investments when we brought Spark into Azure Cloud. And there are many aspects of interactive big data, like uh, you want to be interactive when you first explore and experiment with data, but you also want to be able to easily share data with others uh, in a very quick and inter interactive way as well. As men Matt mentioned, that is actually what unlocks uh, kind of big data inside of organizations, this ability to easily share uh, data artifacts and data, data sets uh, across the organization. And then once you move towards uh, development of production code and debugging of your production code, uh, this development cycle, notion of short development cycle also matters. So that brings us to uh, Spark on Azure. So what we uh, focus on uh, in terms of kind of a product shape of our offering in Azure for Spark is not only uh, bringing kind of robust Spark bits with all of the support uh, and um, uh, availability SLA that Matt described to you very well uh, in the cloud that makes kind of Spark production ready or enterprise ready, but also focus on the tooling around Spark that delivers on all of the stages of data lifecycle or project lifecycle you can think of and uh, pro uh, makes, makes you uh, productive. And uh, of course, we are, we are in the beginning of this uh, kind of a big data journey and not everything is perfect, but what we've got so far uh, allows us to uh, provide solutions for every kind of major uh, part of your uh, data work. Uh, in a way that you can actually be productive and work with your data in an interactive way if you are careful in some places. Actually, before I move on, so uh, just to be more concrete, so there are three pieces of around tooling uh, that we made investments. And uh, our, one of the principal positions towards kind of release of Spark, we, make everything 100% open source. So if you deploy Spark cluster in the cloud, what you find inside of this cluster is all open source. Uh, and uh, why we did this is, uh, while Spark as a platform is great, in order to build this interactive solution, we need to add pieces here and there, fix bugs, or even implement some new components. And we uh, built those things and kind of open source. Uh, so 
whenever you use Spark on, in Azure environment, you, you have the knowledge that it's all kind of uh, standard Spark. There is no lock-in. Uh, it's all open technologies. So the first component is built around Jupyter notebooks, that, that the notebook experience for data exploration. Uh, then we build an IntelliJ plugin, so you can build your production code easily. Uh, and finally, for BI and data asset sharing, we've built our DPC connectors for Spark that are connectable to Power BI, Tableau, or other BI tool of your choice. At the latest stage, when you deploy your Spark pipelines or data pipelines in production, you'd like to connect to the environment where these data pipelines live. And in our case, this is Azure. So we provide also connectors to various Azure services. Like if you want to build a batch pipeline, there is nice orchestration framework in, for your batch pipelines in Azure called Azure Data Factory. You can use that if you want to build real-time streaming pipeline, which Spark supports also. Uh, we also provide connectors for uh, Event Hub, which is an event service or queuing service in Azure, similar to Kafka. Uh, or uh, Power BI now supports real-time dashboards, so we provide a push mechanism to publish your real-time dashboards uh, into Power BI as well. Okay, with that, we'll switch into uh, kind of a more risky part of our discussion, which is demos. So let's see uh, how you can kind of go about your data journey in an interactive way. To give you context, you know, we will start with, no, oh, sorry, need to switch it off. Okay. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Azure portal. So in Azure portal, uh, basically Azure portal gives you access to a variety of services on Azure. And one of them is HD Insight clusters. So if you click on HD Insight clusters, you'll see a collection of clusters, Hadoop clusters, HBase clusters, Storm clusters, or Spark clusters that you have in your subscriptions. If you want to create one, it's easy. That's one of the kind of benefits of the cloud that you don't need to set, set up your own Hadoop or Spark. You just click a few buttons, and we'll deploy a uh, ready-to-use Spark cluster for you. Let's say it's a, it's a demo cluster. Then you can select a cluster type. So we support various types. Spark current, right now is in preview. Uh, recently, we also announced our server on Spark. Uh, is there anybody who, who, is, uh, who has a R as a, their programming language of choice? Oh, few, few people. So as you probably heard, uh, Microsoft acquired recently Revolution R. So R server is the next version uh, after this acquisition. And we uh, kind of updated Revolution R execution engine to actually use Spark. So now it pushes down all of the parallel computations into Spark. Uh, and it's available as uh, R server on Spark in, uh, as a, se a separate cluster type inside of Azure. Uh, so we can select Spark our preview of Spark, select standard uh, cluster tier because premium is a R. Uh, and uh, after selecting other parameters of your cluster, uh, the interesting ones would be, you can select what kind of and what number of nodes you want to use for a Spark cluster. For example, you can go with D4 VM type, which, is, uh, which gives you uh, how many, uh, four cores, or you can go with a bigger VM type like D14, which gives you 16 cores and 100 gigabyte of memory per node. Uh, and you can select arbitrary number of uh, nodes that you want. The important part here is that after you deploy your cluster, you can also scale up and scale down your cluster, which we'll get back into a minute. It is an important aspect of uh, why cloud is so friendly uh, to big data because of that capability. Uh, okay, so let's uh, close that part, and we'll just use existing cluster, so we have our demos going smoothly. So I have a few clusters. Uh, okay. Uh, when you open a cluster, you can see various details about it, what kind of nodes I use and how many nodes it has, uh, information about your subscription, how much of subscription it uses, and it also provides various Hadoop interfaces. So there is uh, 
monitoring management console available to you. Uh, we use Ambari uh, for that. Uh, it allows you to have direct control of all of the Hadoop services and Spark services on the, clu on the cluster. And we also provide access to a Jupyter notebooks that we installed on the cluster. So if you click on Jupyter, uh, here we go. So Jupyter is, a, I don't know how familiar with you with that, uh, Jupyter is one of the most popular notebook types. Uh, and it basically gives you a file system with folders and files where files are notebooks. So you can open the notebook and uh, let's say you'll open this one. Actually, I have already it opened here. Let's just switch the tab. And for the uh, Jupyter notebooks, we did uh, a work to connect it in a nice way, let's say, to a Spark cluster. So by default, there, there are uh, existing connections of Jupyter notebooks. So Jupyter notebook is an open source project uh, to Spark. But they uh, always require kind of for the Spark driver to run inside of the uh, notebook server itself. And that limits your availability and scalability. And actually, some of the scenarios where you want to connect to multiple clusters are not possible in this case. Your notebook server has to live on the cluster. So we broke down these limitations and we've built this type of architecture. So we used Livy, which is a job submission service for Spark. So we collaborated with Cloudera to add features to that service and open source these features. Uh, and then we built a, a component for Jupyter itself called kernel. So kernel is what actually drives computations inside of the notebook. So we build this kernel that connects to Livy and submits Spark instructions to this Livy, and Livy in turn talks to the Spark cluster to execute uh, your Spark commands. So this is an example uh, notebook that demonstrates what you can do with, with, uh, with our uh, Spark magic, so-called kernel, uh, and, with, uh, and with Spark. Uh, again, so Spark magic kernel is, again, fully open source. Here's a link where you can uh, go and download it and install it on your on-premises cluster if you like. Uh, and what it allows you to do, it allows you to first, as a regular notebook, you can have kind of rich content uh, and explanations uh, directly represented in the notebook, but you can also go forward and uh, execute some code. So first we extended this Spark Magix kernel with additional so-called Magix, which is additional commands that you can do. Uh, one of the example is percentage percentage help, which basically gives you information about what other magics you can do. So we, we won't go into too deep into details here, but you can see that we support built-in SQL that uh, automatically executes SQL state, uh, Spark SQL statements for you. Uh, and we have uh, percentage percentage local, which is a very powerful um, magic that allows you to run arbitrary Python code inside of your notebook. And we'll, we'll see in a minute uh, how that, that is useful. Uh, another feature of our uh, uh, kernel is uh, automatic visualizations. Oh, let's actually remove that. So this is a SQL magic that would submit Spark SQL command back to a cluster. So if I execute it and executing the cell is simple, you just press shift enter on the cell and the star here demonstrated that the job was executing, and now it, it is already done, and automatically it shows for my SQL query uh, first table representation of the data. But I can also switch to a uh, different visual representation and select that for this data set, which is representing some uh, HTTP sessions, some traffic, web traffic, I can uh, instruct it to calculate uh, count of sessions by a state. And in this kind of dirty, quick and dirty way, I can quickly visual, visualize my data better understand it. So that's one feature. Uh, but uh, capabilities of this auto visualizations are kind of limited to whatever few visualizations we have built in. Uh, this percentage percentage local magic, we actually allow you to uh, do more than that. Uh, so this is how it works, basically. you. Uh, you can put in uh, arbitrary Python code and use a variety of Python visualization libraries. And Python is a very data science friendly language or popular language uh, in the data science community. Uh, it has a variety of visualization libraries. So in this particular case, what we do, 
uh, is we calculate uh, some interesting statistics about the data, and then we use Plotly visualization library to, uh, to plot the results. Okay, did I press shift enter? Maybe not. Okay, and once it uh, completes, it actually draw, uh, renders a state map for me. So pretty advanced visualization available from the community. And they can bring it in into my notebook and use to, visual, to work and visualize, visualize my data. That's kind of an overview of capabilities of the notebooks. Uh, but that, those capabilities serve really well during data exploration phase. Uh, okay, so let's... Uh, to do kind of interactive data analysis. So uh, let me switch to this uh, simple machine learning notebook to illustrate how this interactive data exploration is possible. So in this uh, notebook, we have a data set which, uh, which uh, represents food inspection results. And this notebook guides us through the steps of how you take this data and turn it into a predictive model that predicts whether food inspection results will be positive or negative. So the first step of this uh, cell is some initialization. We can skip that. Um, the second step is interesting. So here we actually take the, get access to the raw data. So we have food inspection uh, text file uh, that represents the data. And we can say that, hey, I want to just grab this file and parse it. And as a first kind of insight into this data, I would like to take the first row and take a look at it. So if I execute this cell, uh, given that Spark is a sufficiently interactive engine behind the scenes, it uh, immediately gives me the answer. Hey, he, this is the beginning of your data set. Uh, now that I, I know what the columns are, I can build a data frame. So that's the next Spark construct, which says from the raw data, you can switch into a tabular form of the data by naming the columns and giving structure to the data. Uh, so after converting the data into uh, data frame, I can now take a look at it in the tabular, tabular format. So I simply say, show first five rows, and now not only five rows uh, that I see, I also have a notion of columns and types. So that is interesting, because now I can start running SQL queries over this data. Uh, for example, I can uh, show uh, distinct uh, values for the results. That's a data frame. Uh, Spark data frame language for expressing your SQL language. But I can also say, so where is count results? Uh, but I also can register my data frame as a temporary table. So in this case, it's called count results. And run SQL queries, kind of real SQL queries against this table. So now in a few steps, I went from the CSV file into running um, SQL queries over my data. So I can use group bias and familiar constructs uh, to do that. And while I'm doing it, I can use uh, auto visualization to kind of understand the results very, very quickly. So uh, that allows me to kind of uh, start understanding my data in a very interactive step-by-step step step process. So in the interest of time, let's just run all of the, all of the cells that are remaining and quickly go through the results. So once we uh, start, uh, start to gain some understanding of the data, oh, we, were, we, were, yeah, we were here. We can start uh, uh, gen generating, uh, oh, we, we can start working on the machine learning model. And that, we'll start that with extracting some features, assigning labels to our data, kind of shaping our data set into something that we can feed into a machine learning model. So that process goes here. And finally, we are starting to build a logistic regression model. Uh, basically, after tokenizing and uh, kind of shaping our data, we can learn some properties about it. And uh, after training the model on this data set, uh, we can even uh, evaluate the results. And let's skip to the final results. Uh, we can uh, run, again, queries on these results to kind of build a distribution of how well our model behaved on this uh, test data set. And again, we can use uh, visualization library to, to visualize performance of our model. So that, that is a fairly simple kind of sample machine learning notebook that illustrates this interactive uh, process of going 
uh, about exploring your data and building the model. Uh, but the sample data set here is fairly small. Uh, that, that because it's a sample, but what do you do when your sample data, uh, when your data set is actually big? Uh, fortunately, uh, Spark has solutions for that as well. So in this notebook, I have New York uh, taxi data set, which is uh, not too big. It's 180 gigabytes, but it's big enough that I wouldn't be able to interactively work with it in a regular kind of a local notebook. But with Spark, I can. Uh, and there are two mechanisms how I, I do this. The first mechanism is very popular, uh, actually brings you back into a small data world. Uh, it's based on sampling. So that's a very common approach, and Spark has built in a uh, command to sample your data. So that's where this notebook starts. It actually builds a sample of this 180 gigabyte, uh, compresses it into some smaller number, and does analysis of uh, this sample data set uh, in the similar steps that we just went through. It kind of looks through the data, analyzes, take, grabs the data, the sample data set, uh, uh, shapes it into a specific form, uh, then runs some queries uh, over it to understand the data. For example, this is a New York taxi trip data set. So we can uh, take a look at the number of trips by passenger count. And in the sample, we, we see that it's um, 90,000, that, that was the maximum number. Then we can take a look at different, uh, at other distributions of this data. Uh, distribution of tip amounts and things like that. Um, interesting one is tip amount by fare amount. Uh, on, on this chart, you can see that depending on the uh, amount of money that people paid, they have different models of paying tips. That's interesting. But uh, how, do, how do I go and switch back to the big data set? For example, uh, if I'm looking at this distribution and I know that it's based on the sample, how do I validate that this distribution holds true on the big data set? Uh, with Spark, I can do this switch fairly quickly. So it should be, yeah. Uh, so I already have a full data set. It's called New York Taxi Full here. And I uh, cached this. Uh, data set in memory. So I have fairly large Spark cluster, so it's very easy for me to catch this 180 gigabytes. And now I can run the same queries that I used to generate this uh, distribution on the full data set. So let's try to do this. So this is aggregation queries that runs or a full data set and tries to build the counts uh, of the, tries to build the passenger counts uh, over the trip counts. So it executed in a in several seconds, uh, about six to 10 seconds. And now I can use the same visualization uh, cell to, to plot this result. So now we can see that the results of trip counts based on the full data set are expressed in hundreds of millions. So that's, that's, a, that's a value that you can see. But what's important is that the shape of this distribution is the same as the shape of the distribution that I built based on the sample. That allows me to switch kind of in the moment to the full data set. And uh, in our case, that, that switch was very simple. I just run the query because uh, my cluster is already like has 100 nodes. But uh, in real life, you don't need to have this large cluster already available. You can just go back at any moment to your cluster and say, hey, I'm about to run some bigger query on the large data set. Let me scale this cluster on demand to some large number so I can quickly execute this query and keep my kind of development cycle quick so I keep myself productive. So that kind of uh, cloud, cloud power is very convenient to, uh, to uh, make sure that uh, your large, larger jobs can still execute within short period of time. So now we are at the stage where we can handle both big and small data uh, in a fairly interactive manner. But how do I move to the next phase? Once I'm satisfied with my results, uh, well, once I've found something interesting about the data, how do I share it with my colleagues? Well, the first way to share is just download this do uh, notebook as a file. This is just a file, I can send it in attachment, and on any other Jupyter instance, people can open it and just look at the visualizations, even without the Spark cluster. That's one way. But that's not the most productive way or easy way to share. 
Uh, they also support BI tools for the sharing. Uh, they, uh, they have Power BI integration as well as Tableau and other BI tools connected to the Spark cluster. So that's a much easier way to share. Uh, in this notebook, we have another sample data set, which is an IoT, Internet of Things type of data set. It represents temperature uh, in the buildings, uh, target and actual uh, temperature in the buildings for the cooling system. So what uh, this notebook does, it uh, again uh, captures the data in a raw format, transforms it in some way, but then saves this resultant data set that I want to share in a hive table. So in the, in the table called HVAC. And that table now is accessible for my BI tools. So let's go into Power BI and try to kind of access this data. So in Power BI, I can just, okay, let's delete it. In Power BI, I can just click on the Get Data tab, select Services, and select Spark Cluster as my source of the data. And now it asks me for, for the URI to my Spark Cluster. So the URI should actually be, uh, yeah, not this one. For the HWAC table, it should be. Yeah, I think, yeah. I'll provide my credentials. And now I have a direct connection from my Power BI back to my cluster. So the direct connection here means that Power BI will not try to execute any queries uh, locally because we are dealing with potentially big data. It will actually push down all of the queries into Spark. And Spark will be able to handle this big data set. So now if I go into this newly added data set, I can see all of my tables here available for me. And uh, in Power BI, even using Web UI, I can go and start building uh, some charts to share with my colleagues. So let's see. So let's uh, try to get average of the temperature, average of the temperatures. And we'll, we can add some filtering. Yeah, and uh, of course, it, now it takes, uh, it requires me to kind of warm up my cluster. Uh, so for the connection to the cluster, we use Thrift Server. Uh, and uh, by default, after some time out, Thrift Server uh, deallocates its uh, executors in Yarn. So the first time you use it, uh, it actually uh, takes a few seconds to warm up. OK, let me maybe switch to the other cluster that should, have, should be already up and running. Let's see if this works. Okay, yeah, this one works. So now I can switch between various visualizations and I can see, uh, I can request uh, an area chart that displays average temperature in a specific building. And let's add a filter to say that uh, filter to a building 16, for example. So now I have a chart here. I can switch from one building to another. It automatically submits new query to Spark cluster and given that the, this particular data set is small enough for the cluster size, Spark is able to execute this query in a fairly interactive manner. Uh, so from this point on, I have all of the power of Power BI, which is similar to other BI tools, where I can share these charts with my colleagues. I can build uh, reports, so I can save this as a report. Let's say save it as a new chart. I can save it as a, as a report. I, I can then go and say, pin it uh, to a dashboard called Spark. Uh, and then I can, now I have two of them on this dashboard. And I can share this dashboard with my colleagues. Uh, so that's uh, fully kind of a, a production ready BI solution where you can uh, send a URI to this page with your reports to your colleagues 
or to your customers and share the BI and data. Uh, so uh, now we are at the stage where uh, we can share, we can kind of understand data. Uh, once we are ready to move to a production code, uh, probably notebooks is not the best tool to write your production code. And given that Spark is friendly to Scala, uh, we chose to support a full-fledged IDE environment to simplify writing this uh, Scala programs for HD side clusters. So in IntelliJ, we have a plugin that allows you to write your Spark programs and easily uh, uh, send these pro programs to HD side clusters. So in, in the settings of the idea, IntelliJ idea, if you go to plugins, you can type in HD inside and install this plugin uh, in order to get access to it. Uh, so in this uh, very simple sample, uh, I have a Scala program that does, that, that, uh, that calls uh, some execute job method here. We can take a look at what it does. Uh, so it just grabs some data from the input, uh, does uh, filtering, does some another calculation, and saves the results back. So I can submit this job uh, to my cluster by just clicking using this plugin. I can just click Submit Spark Job. And uh, it will connect to my Azure subscription, and uh, I will show me all of the clusters that I have. So I can select my Spark cluster, uh, then select what class I want to submit to my cluster in, in, inside of this job, and just click Submit. Uh, and it will use, again, this Levy job server that I mentioned we use for notebooks. So we use this, the same job submission server for Spark for IntelliJ plugin. Uh, and it uses it to submit job to the cluster remotely. So from my dev machine, I can submit jobs there. Uh, I can also click on this button to take a look at how my job is progressing. So that will open Spark UI. If I was quick enough and job hasn't finished yet. No, it's already finished. OK. We'll need to try again. Now we can go into the job history. Oh, sorry. Uh, Spark history server. And it may take some time. Well, it's doing its thing. Let's switch back and uh, take a look at another mechanism to kind of simplify and speed up your Spark development. So submitting jobs to the production cluster is, is a great, important step. But usually before you do that, you actually debug your jobs locally. Uh, so it's very easy to do in the uh, IntelliJ idea. So here's a sample of local debugging. So important uh, piece of configuration from the previous job was that the input paths to the, to the files were actually pointing to the blob storage. So that's a, a blob storage file system for Hadoop that we use to connect Spark clusters to the cloud storage. But in a local sample, you can uh, switch those to local references to a local file. Uh, and uh, then you can instruct Spark to use local con context. And that gives you complete debugging experience. So now if you go back to this execute method, we can put these breakpoints and run debugging on this local job uh, and uh, actually have full-fledged debugging experience inside of IntelliJ IDEA. So now I can ex explore the local variables, take a look at the sample data set, what it contains, and um, uh, make sure that my code runs well. Hmm. OK. That didn't work out that well. Uh, and finally, we have support for uh, remote debugging as well. Uh, so remote, remote debugging is a fairly powerful technique uh, in terms of uh, debugging your uh, jobs that run on large data sets. Uh, it's, it's frequently the case that uh, on a small data set, everything works fine. But then once you try to run your job on the production data set on terabytes of data, uh, only then you'll find that some data skew issues or some uh, in normality in the data that will actually break your, break your program. 
So you can also, you can either go through the logs of your job to debug it, or much more productive is actually being able to connect your debugger to the running job on the cluster. And we support this through um, uh, virtual network connectivity that Azure supports. So uh, in this case, it's a fairly advanced configuration, but you can deploy your cluster inside of the virtual network in Azure and connect your local development machine through a VPN connection to this virtual network. And in that configuration that I just did, you can actually specify uh, specify a Yarn client mode kind of deployment model for your in local IntelliJ job and uh, submit your job from your local machine directly into the cluster uh, using this VPN connection. So in the logs, you can see how your uh, driver program that now runs locally uh, connects to the Yarn as a resource manager on the cluster and requests container on your cluster to execute your job at the full scale on the large data set. Uh, so now it's in accepted state. Yarn is allocating now containers for a job to, ex to be executed on the cluster uh, while your program that is controlling the driver program that is controller, controlling this job is actually running inside of IntelliJ. And the benefit of that configuration is that you can actually also uh, set breakpoints on your driver code and actually debug your job uh, uh, while it's running on the cluster. So that's uh, another powerful and productive mechanism to debug your jobs. Okay. So with that, let's uh, switch back to our slide deck. Yes, you know that part. So here are a few resources that you can use to uh, kind of uh, familiarize yourself with various things uh, we did with Spark in Azure environment. As long as there is a, a link to the, uh, this New York taxi data set uh, notebook, which is a very large data notebook, uh, it actually goes into various ways to build your machine learning model. It's a, it's a good kind of a, uh, educational ma material or just end-to-end -end example of how to use Spark uh, inside of Azure environment. Uh, as well as links to our open source elements, uh, artifacts like the Spark Magix uh, library for Jupyter notebooks, as well as the connectors for Power BI. And with that, uh, if you have any more questions, I'm, I'm here to answer them, or I'm, I will be around uh, available for your questions as well after the, after the session. Thank you, Maxim. Anybody have anything? All right, mob him too after this is over. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Jonathan March, are you in the building? Yeah, there he is. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. It's confusing because I got to go this way on my screen to go that way and that way. Because uh, I haven't oriented that. Cool. Uh, I guess everyone can hear me. Cool. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about big data for the Agile Enterprise today. Um, this actually was sort of a topic that I've been writing about for a little bit and thinking about for many years, uh, but didn't really uh, put it all together until recently to put this presentation together. Um, but let's go ahead and dive in. It's a little bit different than some of the presentations that have gone so far. Can everybody hear me okay, first of all? Any hands or no? Uh, yeah, so it's a little different from the presentations that have been given so far. I'm gonna speak a little bit more philosophically about what I've seen in the space, uh, and a little bit about where I think things are going in the space, and how I'm working towards that future, uh, and how Texture, the company that I'm working for, is working towards that future. So let's just dive in a little bit. Uh, so first of all, uh, there's a nice picture of me. I used to work at Yammer, uh, and Wikia, and Lyft, and a bunch of other places before that. Uh, my background is computer science. I got an engineering degree from UIUC. Uh, this was in 98, so it's been a while now. Uh, 
<clears throat> I started uh, early in my career, even during my undergrad, I was working as a Unix administrator and got a lot of exposure to Sun, Solaris, and a bunch of other platforms, but did focus a lot on Solaris at the time. It was pretty, uh, pretty popular. Um, and then during my undergrad, I also had an opportunity to become an Oracle database administrator. So I actually, uh, before my junior year of, of my bachelor's, uh, was working as an Oracle uh, database administrator. I went to like five weeks of Oracle training, sort of came back and was that. But early in my career, I went to a place where I was administering all of the databases you could imagine. It was a back-end uh, sort of enterprise company. Uh, we had enterprise software that had to run on all the platforms. Uh, the company was called Trilogy, if any of you had heard of that. Uh, but I got exposure to all these platforms and was administering and tuning and tweaking and, and having a good time learning about that. I didn't really find administration work was sort of uh, something that was, I was passionate about. Uh, maybe I didn't like having the sort of God complex that was necessary to have that role. Uh, so I started getting more into doing database engineering, uh, specifically Oracle PL SQL, and I went through a whole stint of doing many different projects of Oracle PL SQL billing systems and, and invoicing systems. I did some content management workflow stuff and also did some web analytics when I was at Cormetrics. Um, in my free time, I was writing neural network code from scratch to run in Oracle PL SQL. I was just really like heads down in that and really excited about uh, database engineering. From there, I started working more as a data engineer, got exposure to large data platforms like Redshift and Vertica, was also doing a lot of work with Postgres, PostGIS, uh, uh, GIS, and, and MySQL. Um, so I had a pretty broad exposure to those different platforms, and I had built a lot of custom ETL systems. So each startup that I had gone through from Yammer to Wikia to Lyft and to now at Texture uh, were custom building ETL frameworks that would, be, that would help organizations manage their data and manage their information well. And I've done this across pretty much all languages uh, that were more scripting languages, uh, but also did some work in Java. Um, in terms of data architecture, uh, I sort of have this part of my like, career and, and my uh, expertise at this point, I sort of lean heavily towards open source systems. I believe that like, the data ecosystem has become so fragmented now that there's a lot of options for different parts of the ecosystem and that there's an incredible amount you can do just plugging one open source project in with very minimal amount of custom code. And so that's a, that's a big philosophy I have around data architecture that sort of shapes who I am and what I'm about. And in terms of data analytics, I had roles where I was responsible for data analytics, specifically at Wikia. Um, and I'm just, I'm SQL all the time kind of guy. I think that SQL is one of the most powerful languages for doing analytics, uh, just because of the set-based nature of it. Uh, it feels to me like uh, just a, a match made in heaven. Uh, so a little bit about Texture. This is the company that I founded uh, with my co-founder, Chris, who's also here. Uh, and this was founded after, after we both left Lyft. Um, it's essentially a data management and information modeling platform. Uh, and we ingest streaming and third-party data directly into Redshift to, Prior to that, S3, if you want to think about that as the lake. Um, and we have an inf information modeler uh, that basically anyone with SQL knowledge can go in, they can write SQL, they can turn those into scripts. So we have like sort of staged uh, SQL writing where you can uh, build temp tables in a transaction and do a lot of intelligent things with that. And then we have literally one click test for that and one click deploy for that. So anyone who has SQL knowledge can come into our platform and, and start modeling data. Um, and I think, uh, sorry, I think that's the last one. I do want to point out that this 3 of 423 is a joke, just in case anyone thinks I actually have 423 slides. Just trying to string you along a little there. A little there. Uh, but anyway, we also have professional services that we, we provide. So Texture essentially is an automated data warehouse. Uh, there's the URL if you guys want to come check us out. Um, definitely do. Uh, so I wanted to have a quick survey here just so I can get a feel. I know this has been asked in some of the other presentations, but how many people actually feel like are in a role as like a data engineer right now? Anyone? Uh, analysts? Anyone? No? Scientists? There we go. That's the hot one right now, huh? Addicts? Anybody who just likes to use data, has to have data, more data all the time? Okay. Uh, and then what about people working with like more than a petabyte of data? Anybody? All right. You got one there. Okay. Hundreds of terabytes? Just trying to get a, okay, okay. Tens of terabytes? Okay, we're off the scale here. Nobody knows? Don't know, which, don't know how big your data is? Okay, the reason I'm asking that is because I think big data is a pretty loaded term. Um, and, I th and I think that there's two ways that I characterize big data. There's like petabyte scale data. And this is where like a lot of your possibilities of what you want to do with it are probably going to be limited by physics. 
you're dealing with lots and lots of servers, distributed systems, um, and, and there's not a lot of flexibility in that. And then the rest of us, um, I'm not a petabyte guy, just so everybody knows, but uh, the rest of us are dealing with data that's just, it's not small, right? Like maybe we're trying to process it and it just happens to be that we need to deliver something to our customers, to our stakeholders, and they want it by the end of the day and we just, we just wrote our first prototype script for it and we ran it and we're taking some measurements and it's looking like it's gonna take 30 days. So we're, we're dealing with big data all of a sudden. It's too big for us, it's just, it's just not small. And I actually personally find that the not small interpretation of big data is actually one that's more empowering. And I, and I said this a, a lot, through a lot of my, my career when I would hire people and they were, they were looking to get into big data, I would say, wait, I don't think you really wanna be in big data. I think, I think small data is where it's at because small data gives you the flexibility to go in and do, do novel things. Like you can go and, and, and uh, get creative with the data and you're not dealing with as many constraints. So I just wanted to talk about that briefly. So here's my stance. I think it's important to, you know, at least I thought for this presentation, it was important to take a stance on some things. So we sort of frame the conversation a little bit, uh, particularly if you guys have any questions afterwards, but at least frame what I'm gonna talk about here. And this is that I believe that the agile enterprise is leveraging data to embrace change. Uh, and, and I think agile here is a term that I am sort of loosely using, but I do use that in contrast to sort of organizations that are following more of a waterfall methodology and things like that. Um, and they're leveraging their data. The data is seen as an asset for them, right? It's not a liability to them. They're actually able to leverage the data and they're embracing change in their organization. So they're using data to, to embrace this change and expect change and deal with the dynamics of that um, and be more agile, more flexible, more dynamic. There's, there's a whole lot of words you could use there. But in doing so, these organizations will value algorithms and automation over human processes. And even in fact, inside of the human powered part of the processes, uh, there are sort of processes that are human powered where there's like one guy or gal at your company that can do this work, or maybe it's a small team. All right, that might be a little better. Now we have more than one person we can go to. Maybe we can distribute it. So now we have a distributed human process. So like everyone on the team could do it. But ultimately you wanna to move towards that distributed process where humans can get in and do things is they can go in and, and program algorithms and have an automated system that's gonna execute those for them. And so I believe that the Agile Enterprise that's actually leveraging data to embrace change is really valuing these algorithms and automation over the human pro powered processes that might exist today. And it, so a little bit about what I was saying in terms of process manage, management, this means that a centralized process will eventually give way to a distributed one, which will eventually give way to something that's automated. The machines will essentially be taking over and doing the work for us. So that's a lot, it's a big statement, but that's sort of a stance that I wanted to start with. And I wanted to back that down a little bit and step back to something that I think that we all can agree on. And it will sort of like work our way through the narrative. But I think we can all agree that data is an asset. It's a liability in a lot of places, but we want to see it as an asset. Um, and I think that leaders across all parts of the organization, from the uh, really technical leaders all the way through really heavy on the business side, could agree that they would like data to be an asset at their organization. And so if we start from that understanding, the next thing that we're, we're wondering is like, now that we're conscious of this, that we know that data is something that we want to treat as an asset, how do we get to that sort of elusive data-driven organization? How can we sort of progress uh, and build on this understanding of data being an asset? So I wanted to start with this sort of jolly fellow here. Many of you uh, might know who he is. Some of you probably know who he is, but no, nobody knows who this guy is. Uh, it's Abraham Maslow. And he was a psychologist, and what he came up with after studying human development, he created a model which is known as Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. I think most people in the room are probably familiar with that, but it generally looks like this. This is pulled straight off the wiki page. And the idea is, is that humans develop in stages from physiological needs through safety, love and belonging, esteem, self-actualization, and I believe uh, he even had in his model self-transcendence beyond this. Uh, but this was the diagram that was easy to pull off the wiki. Um, and so there's, there's a, a lot that can be said about this, but the basic idea is, is that the lower levels build, uh, uh, the higher levels build on the lower levels. So 
uh, physiological concerns, food, water, shelter, those sort of things must be met before you're concerned about safety. Like, is, is my life threatened? Do I have financial safety? Things like that. And those are concerns that matter before you're really concerned about love and belonging and human connection, and et cetera, et cetera, up the, up the uh, um, hierarchy. So I think there's some key takeaways from his work. Uh, I should also say, there, there's, a, there's a joke that I don't know if, a meme going around the internet, I don't know if people have seen this, where people put Wi-Fi below this that that's actually a fundamental need. We have to have Wi-Fi before we're worried about our, our food, water, and, and shelter, which I think is somewhat humorous. But uh, there's some takeaways from this that I think that we all could, could learn from, uh, and things that we should think about. Uh, and as I said, humans develop in stages. Uh, and by extension, that means that pretty much everything else in the world that matters to us also develops in stages, at least the things that were created by humans, which I believe is mostly what matters to us. This is not specifically something that Maslow really like discovered and was like the, the uh, voice of. I, I think broadly, if you study uh, psychological development theories, you'll find that this is pretty common, commonly believed that things develop in stages. Uh, you know, you have to crawl before you walk, before you run, this sort of business. Um, and different stages have different motivations. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a key point uh, about how, how you think about if you find yourself in, in, in a certain stage. What are the actual motivations that drive you to get to the next stage? And also that this development happens simultaneously and independently within an organ organism or an organization. Uh, this just means that it might be that in certain areas of your life you're more developed than others. It might be in certain areas of your organization you're more developed than in other areas of the organization. And I think it's a key takeaway that we should take from his model. Uh, and the way that I bring that back to data is I think that data capabilities at organizations actually develop in stages. Uh, and so that's, that's a big part of what, what I'd like to talk about here, at least initially uh, in the presentation. Um, so I've created uh, what I consider my own data hierarchy, uh, hierarchy of data-driven needs is what I've called it. And sort of the fundamental aspects at the bottom of the hierarchy that you have to create or generate data before you can do anything else with it. You've got to create it. And cataloging it just means I've collected it somewhere or I have metadata about it. I'm aware that this data even exists. And now I'm going to warehouse it. I'm going to, I'm going to manifest it somewhere. I'm going to persist it. I'm going to put it in a centralized place. I'm going to organize it, standardize it, things like that. And that these things have to occur sort of in, in this staged order before it opens up the higher levels of the hierarchy, which would give you the ability to actually explore that data, dive in, see the properties of it, analyze that data, and then moving up higher, you could go in, I actually want to, after I've analyzed it, this is a useful piece of analysis. I've generated something, a, a new model of data. I would actually like to you know, deploy that model somewhere and use that model to drive my business. So that deployment could be pushing keys into a Redis store of that information, could be creating a table, could be making an API, uh, et, et cetera. But the idea is, is that uh, progressing up this chain uh, is sort of necessary if you really want to become a data-driven organization. So I'm highlighting this bottom section here because I actually believe that what this section is here is actually big data. I think in general, big data has been sort of conflated to be this whole thing, and that everything in the world fits under this umbrella of big data, at least everyone who's working in the data space and, and their world fits under this big data. But I actually, I, I don't think that that's reality. I think that actually these core things at the bottom are dealing with data management and data assets, and that this top part up here is actually what I'm calling big info or big information. And that's the part where you're actually taking human knowledge and applying it to this raw data and turning it into something that a knowledge worker could use. All right, so this is like making an asset, an information asset for your business. Um, so I'll take those away uh, but, so you can see sort of the, the, uh, um, the names that I have for each level here. But the color is sort of the green here. Uh, is, is the uh, big data space and then the big info space is the top. And I'm mainly going to focus on the big data space in the bottom here, but I want to at least lay out the, uh, the overall model that I have here so that you can sort of think in the same headspace that I'm in. So if we're going to talk about that, that uh, big data space at the bottom, I believe we're talking about data management and that this the create, catalog, and warehousing pieces of of the hierarchy that actually matter for data management. Traditionally, these things were, these problems, this data management problem was solved by the Enterprise Data Warehouse, uh, or EDW. Uh, and this is obviously like from the era of Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, uh, DB2, 
uh, from, uh, uh, Teradata, et cetera. There's, a, there's quite a few of them. But essentially, the EDW was the data store for a lot of organizations. So if we look at this uh, from the EDW era, and again, that's the create, catalog, and warehousing side of things. So in this EDW era, what we had is we had processing and storing of data through these ETL processes. We would extract some data from a source, transform it, which was usually applying some sort of information to, to the data. Maybe it's simply turning like a, 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 a numeric field into the values it actually represents. So I've, I've worked places, uh, I, I think around this era a, lot, era, a lot of people who were doing database development or even software engineering had like a very heavy focus on number of bytes in the rows and things like that. And you would see data systems, operational data systems, where instead of having a status field that has like active, disabled, uh, you know, churned, these sort of like status for like a user, they would just have numbers like one, two, and three. So a large part of that transform process was to actually like transform that raw extracted data into something that, that made sense to the business. Um, and all of this sat on top of this, these data management platforms, uh, DBMS, uh, that were existing at the time. And this is still, I'd say EDW era, this is how it was like way before big data was a thing. And it's still in some ways this way today um, because there's a lot of organizations that are building and, and managing their data in this way. Um, typically, these sort of systems were built using a waterfall methodology, which if you remember back to sort of the idea that the agile enterprise sort of leveraging data, well, it, it was a little trickier back then for these organizations to leverage data because they were building on, uh, essentially a waterfall, uh, off of a waterfall process or methodology. And what that really looked like was you would have this team of experts, data warehousing experts, data warehouse engineers, uh, database administrators, uh, data modelers, uh, a lot of different uh, roles that fit in there. And they would spend months on these, pro on these projects. So they're going through the proposal phase, phase, having to have some kickoff meeting to initialize the project. They were going around interviewing all the stakeholders, really finding out what's everyone's needs. They would go through a process. We're gonna design the whole scheme. We're gonna make sure everyone's needs are met. Developing, testing, implementing, the whole, the whole deal. And this was really over months of time. Uh, I went to a lot of organizations uh, and actually ran projects like this myself when I was responsible for building the, the data warehouse at organizations. Uh, for about the past 10 years, that's what I was doing. And they were, you know, Maybe it wasn't happening in the length of time that this, that this was, but it was a very static system. Um, and the, you know, the result of it would be the static ETL process. And maybe it didn't take six months or a year uh, because I was working in, you know, in the Bay Area at early stage startups, uh, young startups, and you know, they, they didn't have that kind of time, so they were working on a shorter time scale. But the basic idea of the waterfall methodology was what was being followed. So these ETL processes that were the result of this, though, were specifically engineered to transform these raw data assets into information for the business. So there was a, there was a kind of vital role that was played by these centralized experts um, in terms of modeling the data and, and storing it in the warehouse. And this is sort of uh, known as dimensional modeling, and it actually generates a, a lot of value for, for businesses because now you have standardized dimensions, facts, and, and roll-ups, aggregations. Uh, so the dimensions being the things you really care about, like uh, users and uh, you know, purchases, products, things like that. Um, and then the facts being like sort of like what's happening with these, uh, uh, with these dimensions, with these objects over, over time and things like that. And then roll-ups, like how can I aggregate this? Somebody's gonna want this by day, somebody's gonna want this by month, somebody's gonna want a rolling seven day for this, things like that. So there was a lot of value in, in, in this dimensional modeling. Um, it provided these clear business definitions. They were reliably produced. They were avail readily available, meaning someone could log into that enterprise data warehouse and have access to all the richness of these, this dimensional modeling, all the dimensions and facts and rollups, and it was easily leveraged. Those rollups that were by different periods meant that like, if I needed data by day, it was there and, and persisted, already calculated, waiting for me to like, leverage in the business. That's definitely the promise of these projects. The reality is that I think reliability was not the outcome. And the, and the reason that I think that's true is that I believe that these ETL systems were built from a waterfall-minded uh, mindset. Uh, and so you had extracting from, usually from a known data source and a known set of properties, and you were transforming it to format it a certain way or enrich it a certain way. And these were all known before you even built the script. Somebody had planned out and designed and figured this was what you are going to build. You built that transformation and you loaded it into the data warehouse. And that's great, except for this is falsely presuming that the data source is not going to change. Someone's not going to add a property to that table 
as somebody's not going to change the property, the data type of, of something on your source data. It's not going to go from an integer to a big int, and now your downstream table is not going to be able to handle that, right? Or the business requirements, this is presuming they're not going to change. So someone's going to come in and say, like, hey, I need to change this formula, or uh, I know we started saving this information in our operational database that we requested would be really useful for business analysis, but it's not in our warehouse because it's not part of that ETL script. So you need, I need to go make a request to that central team, that human, to go in, modify the script. And so having the extract and the transform and the load all sort of like tied up in one sort of meant that, that there were a lot of ways, like if any piece of that had a failure, the whole thing was a failure. Uh, so basically when these things change, it's broken. And because of the inevitability of change, these happen frequently, uh, and they end up being very expensive to fix. And so I, I believe that these projects rarely deliver lasting value. And, I, and by lasting, I mean that uh, it doesn't require that continued investment. I, I, I see it as I've been in this role many, many times. I've built out teams, and it's always like you can never have enough people, enough humans managing those processes to like go in and, and make small tweaks to enhance them. To, uh, uh, to fix bugs, things like that. And so it's, it's static, it's fragile, and you're con constantly caught in this sort of like cycle of repair and enhancement. And a lot of times the repair and enhancement you're doing is, is to fix something like a data type mismatch, um, things like that, that aren't really adding a lot of value to the business. It's just fixing something that's broken so that the business can continue. And so rather than embracing change and leveraging data, these organizations actually feel data incapacitated. They just can't hire enough humans to, to take on this work. So I believe that the software industry in general recognized the shortcomings of Waterfall roughly about a decade ago and have been moving away from Waterfall methodologies towards more agile methodologies. Uh, and agile, of course, is uh, characterized by the fact that requirements and solutions evolve over time and that this happens through collaboration between cross-functional teams. Um, and interestingly, Agile took off about a decade ago, which was roughly when Hadoop was created and sort of like launched into the wild. Um, and that basically was the initiation of the big data movement. Um, I include like Hadoop and NoSQL uh, as sort of together in the, as, as the big data movement, because I think they both come from, from similar origins, uh, which I'll get to a little bit uh, here uh, in the next slide. Um, but yeah, they, uh, the NoSQL movement, I guess, came about maybe four or five years after, uh, after Hadoop had already launched. Uh, and the big thing about big data that was unique was that it separated storage from processing. And this is pretty common. I'm not, this is not anything I figured out. This is pretty obvious. There's plenty of blog posts about this. Uh, but basically, the, once you separated the storage from processing, now you could just like dump a bunch of data into HDFS or a NoSQL store. Uh, and then you could have people handling the processing separate. So they're running MapReduce jobs and doing something that's definitely not SQL, uh, at least at the time when this was really taking off. That's certainly changed recently. Um, but it also gave rise to these roles of a data engineer and a data scientist. And the thing that really made that possible uh, was unstructured data. Uh, so that was sort of created what was like the communication, you know, the protocol between these two cross-functional teams so that they could collaborate, right? So if we go back to this part of the hierarchy, and again, this is sort of our, our creating, cataloging, and, and warehousing of data, but we look at it in the big data uh, era rather than the EDW era, what you see is that we have store as a separate item from process, and that the thing that underlies that is unstructured data. I think that this is... Uh, uh, the strength of the big data movement, and I think it's, it's been pretty amazing. In fact, I think that it's actually been a revolution in, in data management um, because that meant that the changes to the source or, or changes to requirements didn't actually result in like a systemic failure because if somebody wanted to add another property to that unstructured data, they would just add it. And, and because it was unstructured and people on the processing side were not you know, uh, tailoring it specifically to a, a serialization format, they could handle that. It would just get ignored. Uh, it, it, it would be handled just fine. And so this, this separation of storage and processing, the innovation of that actually gave birth to data lakes that would sit sort of next to uh, the warehouse in some ways. Um, I probably could have slotted that somewhere into the, the new version of the hierarchy, but um, I think it's just a, a core part of, of data warehousing or data lakes. Um, so you're, you're taking data, you're extracting it, 
you're loading it into that lake. That's sort of like your storage side. And then you have transforms for consumption on the other side and turning it into things that are valuable to the business. Um, and actually now I think the, you know, this innovation has even taken off that if you go back and you look at the EDW space, um, people who are working in SQL stores uh, and, uh, and their traditional database management systems, you find that they're actually turning them into data lakes now. So the data lake uh, uh, sort of idea is, is sort of creeping into the, the DBMS world. Um, so, because there's, there's been a transition uh, from sort of this idea of having your business logic and your information modeling tied up in the, the transform phase of this, well, let's just like load raw data and do the transform later. So that EL piece is sort of now separate, and now we've got a uh, transform as, a, as a, uh, a, an after uh, thought or an, uh, sort of the end of the chain. So now you can have many different transforms, right? Um, and this is just a chart that I pulled off of Google Trends to sort of show the decline of the notions of data warehousing while we've seen uh, an increase in the notion of uh, Hadoop and NoSQL, what I call sort of the big data movement. Um, and a big part of that was schema on read rather than schema on write. Um, and that, I think, was a huge part of what was enabling for uh, you know, the creation of the data lake and things like that uh, and, and actually having the separation of these concerns. But it was a big shift. So I think the question is sort of like what happened to that dimensional modeling aspect, right? Like we ended up with these roles of an engineer and a scientist, um, but you know, where are these clear business definitions? Where are they being reliably produced? Where can I go and find this information model? Um, are, they, are they available somewhere? Can I leverage this? Um, and, I, and I think that uh, it, it's a pretty important question to ask, and I think in the past few years the, the data space is starting to to really explode and take care of this problem. Um, but what really was going on for a long time was that data scientists were building data models, transforming it for their needs, testing, training their model, and essentially throwing it away when they're done. And I saw this at a, a lot of different organizations. It was definitely this way when I arrived at Lyft. Uh, it, there, were, there were people who, who were running scripts. It was a 200-line Python script connected to a MongoDB, running through a bunch of stuff, calculating, uh, counts and things like that. But when they were done with that information, that might have been some aggregates, might have been some other useful information, they, they were just putting it in maybe a presentation. It wasn't getting fed back into anything. There was no actual information modeling happening. Um, and so it was, it was actually somewhat limiting, uh, limiting what was going on um, in the data space because people had sort of lost track of dimensional modeling. So I think there was the rise in data science at this time. There's definitely been a rise of data engineering. And as I'm saying, there's where, what happened to the information modeler and, and why is, uh, where's that role and what's been going on with that. And I think because the information modeler got kind of lost along the way, I actually think that unstructured data has been a pretty big failure for information management. Like I said, I think this is changing more recently. But up until the last few years, I think that there actually has been a pretty significant failure uh, in, in this regard. Everyone got really heavily focused on data management because we all of a sudden had these new tools for managing the data part, those bottom three parts of the, of the uh, hierarchy. But got the, the rest of the ecosystem sort of got lost along the way. Um, I think right now there's a lot of EDW experts that are kind of picking up the slack on this and trying to hack their way through this in, by using a bunch of open source technologies. Um, but it, it hasn't really taken shape. And I think that the big information space is what I'm calling it at least, uh, starting to form now to meet that need because people want to have an information modeling product that they can go and use. I think the presentation on, on Microsoft Power BI and some of that, you can see that some of the BI tools are now coming around and, and really getting full, flat, uh, full featured where you can connect all the diversity of the big data systems that are out there and actually do information modeling in these tools and you have one place to go to do that. And I think that that's, that's really great, but it's, it, it's just starting to take off, I think, now. Um, and I think there's, there's reasons for that. I think mostly because the industry has been very fragmented. Um, so I want to shift the gears a little bit here and talk, go a little bit back to the, the uh, separation of, of expertise that happened. So the, the, this decoupling of expertise that happened between people who are doing data engineering work and data science work actually turned into sort of a fragmentation of expertise. Um, and as I was mentioning, that fragmentation actually resulted in a loss of expertise. Like we, we lost the expertise of data modelers, information modelers. Um, I know in recent teams I've worked on, we, had, we basically had no one whose job it was to do information modeling like, on a day-to-day -day basis, like to own that and be that. 
Uh, we had data scientists who were like doing a little. We had data engineers who were doing a little bit. We had data architects doing a little bit, but that role sort of got lost. Um, but now what we have, we have a lot of generalists that are building integrated systems. Um, and I think this is largely motivated and, and, and supported by unstructured data as well. Um, because now everything can be a microservice or a microsystem. Like it's, uh, once, once we separated storage from processing, it, there were hundreds of projects, open source projects, that were launched on, in each of those areas. And, and there have been hundreds of more in the ecosystem around that, sort of fighting for like some market share of the information management space. Um, but it, it's gotten pretty heavily fragmented. Um, and so I think now there's a lot of software engineers that are working in data, and they're spending most of their time configuring and integrating other open source systems. So they're pulling in some Kafka, they're pulling in some you know, Storm, they're pulling in some Redis, they're pulling in some Spark, they're pulling in some, I mean, I could go on and on and on. There's, I, I think in, in some of the presentations we've seen today, I've seen slides with, with more than six technologies listed on them. Uh, one in particular I was counting was like uh, six, seven? I, uh, how many pieces of tech are being used right here? Um, and what's happened from that is that sort of jokes going around the internet, these memes about how everyone's using Stack Overflow to get their job done. Um, anyone using Stack Overflow today already? A few times? Five, six times? Ten times? All day long? All day long? I know I spend a lot more time on Stack Overflow than I used to, uh, and now it's... it's uh, it's almost not even hacking, uh, hacking at that Stack Overflow is there. The complexities of these systems and how many of them you have to integrate. To be, you have to be aware of DevOps things now and, and, and know quite a bit about that to integrate some of these systems. I mean, peop, you know, you're running Docker on your laptops and like it, it's, a, it's a very complex ecosystem. So what I think now is that hacking is the new expertise. So that, that's a, uh, something that's sort of grown out of this. And I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's amazing that we have so many powerful tools at our disposal, that there are these open source projects that solve like really core problems and that we can work to integrate them together and, and that, uh, that that can be done with minimal amounts of code. But so this hacking culture, you know, it, it was an underground subculture. I think for a while, Hacker had this idea, and, and this is pretty common, I think, knowledge as well, is sort of like, there was typically a guy in a hoodie with a Mountain Dew in a dark room working at 3 a.m. Like the, that, that was kind of what hackers were for a long time. And I think it, was a, it, it has become a defining characteristic of the, inter, of the industry now. Uh, many, many people consider themselves hackers. Many organizations now are having hackathons. Um, there's a lot of hacking going on. I think it's, it's really taken over. Um, and sort of the, the hacker motto of like move fast and break things, I, I, I believe came out of Facebook. Uh, but uh, I found this online and thought it was kind of amusing, which was that, like, that, that doesn't work for all sorts of problems that you want to solve. Like, uh, uh, on here, I think this person's saying that he got fired from being a surgeon <laughs> for, for moving fast and breaking things, or uh, what other amusing ones on here, maybe a waiter or a dog walker. But I think you could also add to this list data architect, engineer, and administrator. I think in general, uh, there are a lot of hackers that are working in this space, and I think that there's a lot of productivity coming out of uh, hacking in the data architecture and engineering space, but I think it's actually come at a cost as well. Um, and just a little bit, I, I went and looked up the definition of hacker on a wiki, uh, and this is sort of what's on the, the wiki page, sort of enjoying the intellectual challenge, uh, sort of overcoming and circumventing limitations, um, and achieving novel and clever outcomes. And I think that that's... Uh, I think that describes it pretty well, and I, and I think that it, it, uh, it feels exciting to be a hacker. It feels exciting to be achieving these novel outcomes and things like that. But my belief is that, uh, it, at least in my career, when I've seen something that was novel or clever as an outcome, it usually came with some technical debt. And, and my definition of technical debt is just something that is sort of a deferred resolution of an underlying problem. And interestingly, if you look at the, uh, uh, I, I swapped out uh, data warehouse uh, with Stack Overflow, which is my proxy for rise of hacker culture. And if you look at the rise of Hadoop, it, I, I've never in, in all of my Google Trends usage found two trends that were so highly correlated. So the, the trend in like hacker culture and the use of Stack Overflow actually is a trend that, that I think matches with Hadoop and, and sort of the movement from uh, to, to using unstructured data pretty significantly and the movement from information management to data management.
And so this like HDFS and NoSQL and being able to just like throw in a JSON document and not worry about it, that's actually an asset to a hacker. They don't have to, they don't have to worry about schema changes and schema management, uh, which is great. I, I, I love that every time I use the system that, that lets me. Uh, and I think that because of this, it's led to an explosion of data. We have these massive, massive data lakes out there now. Uh, and there's been an explosion of ways of processing this data. Um, but I think we need to remember that a lot of times what, what is an asset to a hacker, and this goes all the way back to the, the, uh, the hoodied hacker with the Mountain Dew, right? These assets to a hacker usually meant they, they, were, they were capitalizing on someone else's liability. They, they were uh, breaking into a system maybe even. But now I think that the uh, hacker and the modern data, uh, in terms of the data space, actually uh, is also um, taking advantage of these as assets, but is also creating a liability. And I think that this unstructured information has, uh, it is and uh, was and still is a, a liability to the, the data science and analytics groups uh, to those sort of functions. And I think that this is a, uh, another area where uh, the big information space um, is slowly coming in and trying to, uh, trying to capture and, and trying to uh, rectify. And, and this is with things like, uh, I think there's been a huge move to put like SQL on Hadoop and catalogs on top of Hadoop and try to like auto detect things in your data lake. So uh, plugging in things that can scan data and figure out what's there and et cetera, et cetera. But, um, so I think the question, uh, thanks to everybody, first of all, for making it this far with me. It's pretty theoretical. But I think the question about these two areas of big data in terms of the original traditional enterprise data warehouse or big data is like, what can we borrow from those, those uh, understandings of the big data space? There, there have to be sort of pros and cons to each and that we can pull into like what we're going to build for the future. Um, and I think for EDW, I think that one of the advantages of that was that it was a tightly integrated system. Uh, you had one place to go to figure out how to like build and manage and maintain and, and, and the ownership of that uh, was all you know, within Oracle or within SQL Server. Uh, so there was that centralized management of it. And also in the EW time, there was actually a pretty strong focus on generating information assets, the dimensional modeling aspect of that, that I think is really important for us to, to learn from the EDW, EDW era and see if there's ways that we can bring that to sort of modern big data and, and modern information asset management. And from the big data side, we had this, this amazing separation of concerns, right? So extracting data, loading it, and transforming it, let's separate those. That's great. Like now, now we have more reliability, and we can parallelize our work. Uh, we can distribute our work. And so uh, schema on read is just amazing in that regard. Um, now, now we can have many different things that are reading from the schema and, and uh, reading from the data, and they're not going to break uh, if things change with the source uh, system. And we had this idea of distributing, distributing the transform logic or uh, actual information management across the organization. So that, that's a big part of what Texture is, uh, the company that, that I uh, founded. And so we're essentially providing integration and automation uh, plus some information modeling tools and sort of like one place uh, that you can find all of that, one tool that you can find all of that. And so uh, <clears throat> our stance is that this EL piece uh, that we want to we want to bring that forward from the the big data space, but we want to automate all of that, right? So you shouldn't have to uh, you shouldn't have to to build this, manage this. This shouldn't be a human process anymore, right? That centralized EDW team that was managing the ETL processes, like better in big data, but like we don't even want humans touching that anymore. We want to have machines that do that, and so we want to be able to ingest data, any data flowing in, uh, uh, dynamic data changing and have that flow into our data lake and into our data warehouse um, and sort of blur the lines potentially between the, the, the lake and the warehouse because there still are a lot of, uh, I, I believe there's still a lot of benefits to putting data, uh, at, at least uh, large amounts of data in relational database management systems because of the, um, the SQL dialects being more advanced, having a lot more capabilities. Um, I think this is slowly changing, but, uh, but it's a, it's a you know, once you have something that's SQL compliant, you can plug any BI tool into it. It's a, it's a great thing, so. Um, and then the other part that I think that we're, uh, that we take a stance on is that uh, there needs to be some sort of loading after your transform. So when we went to that ELT, when we separated those concerns, you gotta have an L on the end there. 
once you do that transform, once you have people around your organization that are building information models that are being leveraged by the knowledge workforce, you have to, you have to load that data, persist it somewhere, store it somewhere so that it can be leveraged. I think that there's enormous amounts of transforms that are happening in organizations that are being thrown away, and I think that, that uh, having an L after that is um, really, really important to fixing that. I also believe that the, uh, the T part of this uh, equation here, uh, I think there's enormous power that can be uh, accomplished with just using SQL. This is a core part of what we believe at Texture. So this is, this is all part of us saying that like, um, rather than, than relying on your data scientists and your data architects, your data engineers to learn and incorporate dozens of open source projects and the complexity of that, it would be much better to like open up the data modeling aspects of the platform to uh, you know, the broader, part, broader parts of the organization, right? So anyone who knows just a little bit of SQL, in fact, there's a lot of people in the world, there's a, uh, there's a huge market of people that just know Excel. Um, SQL is a very simple language. You know, there's like 10, 12 keywords at most. And, and it's my belief that if you build a uh, information management platform, that utilizes SQL as its core language for doing that information modeling and open that up to large parts of the organization uh, where they can actually transform data and have that L on the end where they're loading it somewhere where their colleagues can actually leverage that is enormously powerful. And this is a huge part of what we're building at Texture. So uh, our, our essential tagline right now is your automated data warehouse. Um, maybe a little limiting based on the broadness of, of the, the talk that I've given so far about the entire data-driven ecosystem. Um, but we are essentially able to automate that EL piece. So we're, we can pull, we can accept streaming data to our API, and that automatically gets scanned. Properties are detected. The data is loaded into uh, a Redshift data warehouse as well as S3 in an organized fashion. Um, and then we also can connect to all your third-party data sources. So uh, our customers that are using, uh, like, Sales, Salesforce or uh, Marketo, MailChimp, like you can imagine a bunch of third-party data services. We can connect to those uh, and ingest all of that data automatically. Uh, and that means that it's not a human process anymore uh, and that it can be automated and it can be reliably done. Uh, and it, it's pretty powerful to have that as just something that you, you, you flip a switch and it's there for you. Um, and once we, uh, this a little arrow here that actually means quite a bit more than, than the thinness of it <laughs> represents on the diagram. But our, our platform actually, once the data is all ingested into Redshift, uh, we provide those modeling tools that let you go in and with SQL you can build these scripts, you can test and deploy them uh, with a click of the button. And uh, that's an enormously powerful part of the platform that's minimized by this arrow right now. There's a lot of other players, some of our competitors in the space, that are doing some variants of this first part, uh, but they're essentially turning Redshift into a data lake. Uh, so they're just dumping data there. And so what they, they couldn't credibly have that arrow on their diagram. It's the reason why I'd like to point it out, because it's really, really a valuable thing to have. Uh, and so we are a data and information asset management platform for the Agile Enterprise. This is sort of the stance that we take, and this is what we're building towards. Um, this is a link to our, our uh, site. Uh, we have request demo button, obviously. Um, Love to get some signups. Love to get more people uh, using the platform, uh, giving us feedback on the platform, uh, and helping us make it better. Uh, so please, uh, please do that, and definitely come up here and chat with me uh, uh, afterwards if you'd like to talk about uh, any specific projects or needs you have. Uh, with that, I'd just like to say thanks uh, for the opportunity to speak here. Thanks for everybody who stuck around the entire day. I came in this morning, and I was like, wow, like I'm not sure if anyone's going to be left. So thank you, everybody, for sticking around. I, I found out kind of late that I was even going to be speaking here. Um, so I apologize if, the, if any of this was uh, a little bit disjoint in, in places and things like that. But uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, thanks to Microsoft for, uh, for hosting the space. This is absolutely gorgeous space. Um, and, and just thanks to everybody. Appreciate it.
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, is this still on? It's really weird up here, you can't really hear. Uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, so one piece, yeah, okay. Uh, you mean like pushing data out? Like specifically, like, like say you want to push data to Salesforce or push a marketing list to, yep. Yeah, so one of the ways that we deal with that problem is that we, don't, we have a, a kind of intelligent ingestion layer. So when we ingest data into our platform, we actually know whether it's a dimensional object or a fact object. So we actually have primary keys that come in on our data. So we have very intelligent actual warehousing of the data once it hits Redshift. So for example, you can hit our API with like a user record and just say this is an update to user ID you know, one, two, three they are now active or whatever, and just send those keys to us, and we'll manage the downstream dimension for you. And one of the ways that, that I mean, once we have data that sort of has that minimal amount of metadata saying like, what this piece of information means, this raw data, is actually an update to this record. Or, it, or with fact data coming in, oh, this is just to append to it, right? And we have multiple different ways of updating dimensional data where you can send us a data set and say, I'd like to swap out the entire table and things like that. So. Uh, we have customers that are streaming data into us, so they've instrumented, say, their like Django or their Rails app. Every time an object's saved, it streams a record to us, and then we have, you know, that causes data drift problems at some organizations, and then we also have the ability for, for us to collect the full data set and replace that. And so I think that it, it gets around some of those problems, but once we have data in a format where we know this is a thing or this is a happening, then uh, the fan out where you would say like, oh, I want to push this data to a third party becomes much simpler, right? Because if we need to update a record in Marketo, all we know is that we have an email address that just had some new key values associated with it. So these properties have updated. So I believe that we're not doing this actively today, but I have built systems that do this, and we managed a system that was pretty extensive that did this at Lyft, where we had abstracted away enough of the pushing data to third parties that that wasn't a problem either. So. Uh, is that kind of getting at what you're saying? I think you're basically saying that you still have to do some amount of extract, transform, load to like integrate with third, potentially third parties. Is that? Yeah, I, I just think it's all about, you know, what's the metadata you can add to that information that can let a machine do it? And that's totally the future we're building towards. We have a, a lot of metadata about what the, what the records mean. Um, so it's a lot, it's really, it's, it's easy for a machine. I, I think it's, it's re relatively easy for a machine to make a decision about what to do with a piece of information. When it has that metadata, it says, well, here's the primary key, and here's all the fields. I would just like to apply that to this, third, this other system. So, and, and then it's just a matter of like writing the integration that knows how to handle that. But the thing about that that's unique from the traditional ETL is that I now have a system where as long as there's a primary key and the field's there, and then there's other fields, I don't even care what they are, that then I can, I can write dynamic code that's gonna just say, oh, here are all the fields, let me apply that downstream. So our, our, uh, our layer where, where we ingest this data into Redshift we, do, we handle things like, it, you know, if we're connected to your MySQL database and, you ch and you're, one of your engineers made the terrible decision to make the user ID an integer, a four byte integer, and they have to change it to eight byte later, you don't even need to tell us. You start sending eight byte integers, our whole system dynamically recognizes that, dynamically modifies the tables in Redshift, dynamically loads the data immediately. I mean, there's no, there's no management of that. It's completely machine generated. I believe that that could be extended to push to third parties 
particularly as we enhance and, and develop the metadata that goes along with data flowing through. Um, but that's, that's kind of, I guess, my stance on it is that, a, <laughs> well, if you, want, if, if you want help building towards that, we, we, we could do a pilot project. We'd be glad to. So. Cool. Yeah, thanks for the question, by the way. Well, thanks everybody for hanging out and being with us today. Also want to thank uh, Microsoft Reactor for hosting us. Oh my gosh, this is totally gorgeous and um, over. Uh, next month we'll be back here with another mini conference. I also want to thank our speakers, um, Andrew, Baiji, Greg, Matt, Maxim, and of course, Jonathan. Thank you 